Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your hosts or co-hosts for today, John DeLynn. Um, it is super good uh, to be with you. Uh, it is October 6th, 2022, and we are here by popular demand. According to Gerardo, there's <laughs> been a lot of people asking for us at Mormon Stories Podcast to do a review of General Conference. Uh, we just had the October 2022 uh, General Conference. It was recently held again in downtown Salt Lake City. And um, I wouldn't say it, it was one of the most scandalous uh, general conferences of all time. I think it may have actually been one of the most benign general conference talks of all time. Uh, we can get into that. Uh, but uh, we are here to kind of give it a review. And Gerardo is the producer on this episode. Uh, Gerardo is the one that kind of came to me and said we should do this. And Gerardo has done the prep work, including kind of... Uh, pulling out kind of the, some of the main topics and the video excerpts. So Gerardo Sumano, mm -hmm. uh, my compadre, welcome. <laughs> welcome back to Mormon Stories. Thanks for being here. Thanks, John. Thank you. Anything you want to say about why you wanted to do this? Yeah, well, I feel like every general conference, I get messages from people like, where are you going to do a review on Mormon Stories for general conference? And we've I don't think ever in the history of Mormon Stories <laughs> has have we covered general conference. I thought, well, if we're going to do it, we can do it shorter. We can do it concise. We can just uh, do it different that other people have done it in the past where like we just show clips of maybe the most important parts or the highlights. You know, it was interesting that what I consider the highlights or what I was seeing in social media as the highlights ended up being what Peggy Fletcher stack from Salt Lake Tribune also considered the fly, uh, um, highlights. I, I hadn't seen her article until you started listing them. And then I was like, oh, I included everything. So, nice. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm excited to get into it. All right. Well, uh, it, we always appreciate what you do. Uh, the popularity of Mormon Stories is so much due to your support over the past couple of years. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, and if that weren't enough, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone else, including non-binary individuals, we also have in the studio... Samantha Shelley. Hey, Samantha. Hello, hello. Samantha is uh, maybe best known to many of you as uh, one of the co-hosts, along with Tanner Gilliland of Zelf on the Shelf YouTube channel. She also is a life coach at what at what website? <laughs> SamanthaShelleyCoaching.com. That's S H E L L E Y, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but but she's also been a co-host now. Uh, she's been a guest on Mormon Stories many times, and she's been a co-host. She's kind of a go a go to co host these days. Samantha, welcome. Thank you. Honor to be back. How does it feel? Good. I didn't realize you guys hadn't done a review of conference before. Yeah, that I'm seems not, shocking. I'm not sure we have. Yeah, so it's kind of fun. Anyway, great to have you, Samantha, as always. And speaking of reviews of general conference, um, if any of you know, uh, one of the new traditions that's emerged in the past uh, few general conferences and or years is that the Brit Vengers, the amazing progressive and post-Mormon uh, YouTubers have started doing a semi-annual review of general conference. And this year, this, this general conference was no exception. And we want to welcome Nemo the Mormon from the YouTube channel, Nemo the Mormon here. Hey, Nemo. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, you, <laughs> you, you actually, uh, you actually did a full review of every session and you sent me a screenshot of the food and the snacks that you bought almost like you were in a bunker. Is that right? Yeah. I, I dug, I dug in hard. I had to get a lot of sugar into my system to get through that. And I think this is another first because it's going to be the first time Mormon stories is more concise than me. And I'm not <laughs> sure how I feel about that. <laughs> That's awesome. Nemo. Yeah. Um, any, anything you want to share just about, uh, your, your experience, uh, you know, what do you want to describe for our audience kind of what you did? Oh yeah, so uh, um, kind of what the reception was. So I sit and watch the conference session uh, live uh, in like at mountain daylight time. Uh, I'll sit and make all my notes, and then 15 minutes after it ends, I'll bring a guest on, and we'll talk about it. We'll react live. We'll talk about what we heard, what we didn't hear, um, and we'll do some live analysis. And uh, I do that for every single session, um, which meant that I stayed up until 4 a.m. Uh, UK time to catch the Saturday evening session 
Uh, I do a running tally, a running tally of something called Jesus, Joe, or Russell, uh, which is keeping a tally of who's quoted more: Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith, or Russell M. Nelson. And, uh, and uh, if you want, I can tell you the, the outcome yeah, of that. I mean, let's just do it. Well, yeah. it. who won? Well, Jesus and Joe, uh, Jesus and Russell, sorry, tied. Um, Joe what? was in a meager third place, but they tied forty men, forty quotes each. Okay, so let me just make sure I get that get that straight. So. Joseph Smith and Russell M. Nelson were quoted the same and the no, most. Jesus, 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 and Russell. Oh, so Jesus yeah. and Russell tied. Yeah, okay. which you would expect Jesus to be ahead, but no, no Jesus bueno. and Russell tied. And Joseph came in a, a distant second. Is distant that right? Second, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's. I I would say that might be progress. Mm. <laughs> Hard to say. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, cool. Well, well, Nemo, we're so glad to have you. Um, you're you're already a legend, and you're just uh, kind of a newbie. Uh, pleasure to be not here. really. What's that? It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have you. And Mormon stories, uh, viewers and guests, we have a really, really big surprise um, because my father, David Joel Delin, is in the house. Hey, David Joel Delin. Hey, hey, how are you guys? Welcome. <laughs> it's nice to be here. So, Dad, uh, how how tell us how old you are, if you don't mind sharing. Eighty-eight, going on ninety. And uh, what is your what is your status with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I'm an Saints? active member of the church. You're an active member of the church? Would yes. you say you're a believing member of the church? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Are you going to get in trouble for being on Mormon Stories? Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> really quickly, what what, is, what do you think about Mormon Stories? Like, I'm going to put you on the spot. Like well, my, I'm my... proud of your talents as, a, uh, as an interviewer, John. You have exceptional talent. You do a wonderful job. Um. I don't always agree with uh, with the with the substance of what you do, but uh, but I'm proud of you for what you're doing. And I support you 100. percent Oh, well, thanks, Dad. Uh, I love you. <laughs> and I, I love you too. I like it that we have a family where we can like talk openly and disagree, but like in some ways still be proud of each other. Absolutely, I, I, I kind of love that. You bet. And I've all, you 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 were actually a witness at my disciplinary council. I certainly was. And uh, yeah, you you've always I, one of my favorite things in the past eighteen years of Mormon stories is getting a call from you, where you've listened to an episode and you give me feedback and you say this is what I loved and this is what I didn't like and I wish you would change this. That is a even if you've got especially if you have criticisms, that shows me <clears> a sign of respect that you would listen and care enough to give feedback. You bet. And uh, that means a lot to a son. And I've always really been grateful that I felt that you were proud of me. Even oh, though you... You've always been a good son, John. All right. Well, I love you, Dad. Thanks for joining us. I love you, too. Are you going to chime in, or are you just going to be a uh, silent? I'll, deep, I'll sit here and watch for a while and then make that decision. What if you have to go to the bathroom? What are you going to do? Hold up two fingers or one finger. <laughs> okay. finger. All right, Dad. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, all right, so uh, we are going to be doing a review, and I think Gerardo is going to kind of lead us in this one, but I am, uh, you know, Samantha and I and Nemo and, and my dad are going to just jump in. So Gerardo, and also we want to we want to thank uh, Maven's, uh, Maven's moderating the chats today, so we want to thank Maven. And we want to welcome our live studio, our live, live stream, uh, you know, Facebook and YouTube audience. Please feel free to comment on the live stream. If any of you want to share your conference experiences, I'll I'll do my best to kind of pause the discussion and read people's comments. That might make things a little bit longer, but it's always fun. All right, so Gerardo, where do you where do where should we go? Sure, we can start with. Uh, so it seemed like Elder Oaks started uh, with general opening general conference on Saturday morning, and he said that he was assigned by President Nelson to start. Uh, with the first talk, and I thought it was really interesting what his talk was, especially when you compare it to other statements by other leaders like Bednar. And you know, I think we should listen to what what Elder Ox said, and then we can comment on it. So this is like this is the the first talk given. Yes, in general conference, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. and we're just gonna hear the first few minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, here's Elder Oaks from the kickoff of uh, the October. 2022 General Conference. Brothers and sisters, our beloved President Russell M. Nelson will address us later in this session. 
He's asked me to be the first speaker. My subject today concerns what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its members give and do for the poor and distressed. I will also speak of similar giving by other good people. Giving to those in need is a principle in all Abrahamic religions and in others as well. A few months ago, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reported for the first time the extent of our humanitarian work worldwide. Our 2021 expenditures for those in need in 188 countries worldwide was 906 million, almost a billion dollars. In a Okay, well, uh, <laughs> that's pretty strong. It's like, hey, we give a billion dollars a year in charity. <clears throat> We're pretty cool, Gerardo. What? Yeah. What's no? That's is this just a kudos, basically? Yeah. Just... I mean, I think it's both, right? Uh, I think we covered it a little bit with when Elder Bednar uh, did the press conference. Something that was really interesting is that he said that as a Church of Christ, it's part of it, it's a principle um, and kind of part of the doctrine to give. Uh, to the needy. And that kind of can be contrasted with, with what Elder Bednar said on the press conference, where Elder Bednar had a different perspective. Elder Bednar said, as a church, we're in, like, our primary goal is to save souls and kind of like giving to the needy is secondary, which we critiqued kind of like that perspective that he gave. I thought it was interesting, you know, to compare it to what Elder Oaks just said. And then, yeah, I mean, it seemed like they're uh, giving a lot more than they used to. Uh, if you go to the next, well, I wish I had put it the next slide, but um, go forward. There was, we can we okay. can go cover that one. He okay. did say um, what almost a billion dollars, and I think that caught my attention because in order from nine hundred and six million you still have almost $100 million to get to $1 billion. So it's interesting that he made that jump and he decided to use the word billion. I don't know if it's because, you know, so many people are used to hear $100 billion, $100 billion, the church is worth $100 billion, you know, or have $100 billion on investments. So he made that leap into mentioning $1 billion. But to put into perspective, if you go to the next slide, it just shows, like, how much a uh, hundred dollar bills would you know represent against a person just a regular size person so there's a person yeah. with a small stack of bills that's that's a million dollars right 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 and most of us i think lay people would think a million dollars that's a lot of money you know i could do a lot with a million dollars and then on the next and the, in the person on the right you ha they have a stack of a hundred million dollars so just to get perspective of how much a hundred million dollars is and how much the church would have to give to actually get to one billion. Uh, so I just thought it was interesting to get to that. If you go one more slide. Um, so we know in 2014, there was a leak that said that there was, uh, that general authorities are paid $120,000 a year. It's probably today's more than that, right? And we don't, that probably doesn't apply to apostles. That was kind of a. Well, the, the, I read the article and the, uh the person from the church who's you know spoke to the news he said that everyone apostles and 70s they all receive the same money i don't know that's what they say who knows but that's but we don't know if they're given bonuses exactly if signing bonuses we don't know what expenses right what what other um benefits they get and year to year increases too yeah right? So that's to the, until they're transparent they could be paying them any amount of money and we just don't know yeah yeah just basing on that amount like it would take 50 years for the entire quorum of the 15th, you know, the 12 apostles and the <clears throat> first presidency to give out their entire um, living allowance for 50 years in order to make nine, the 94 million that Oaks would need to, you know, to get to the 1 billion that he mentioned. Yeah. So is, is part of your point just that, rounding rounding up yes. to skip a hundred million yeah that hundred million could help a whole lot of people yeah that that's my point. point that's my point okay yeah 
And especially when you consider his his own statement from 2016, if you go two slides, you'll see like a Desert News, yeah, that Desert News article where he, in 2016, he, he, he said in a press conference that the church's entire welfare and humanitarian efforts average 40 million per year, um, you know? So in 2016, the church was giving, and before they were giving around 40 million. Uh, and then he even rounded out, he said that the church had given a total of 1.2 billion over the past 30 years. So he's quoted saying that, you know, during a 30 year period, the church gave $1.2 billion. Anyway, so just that, that shows, you know, 40 million, like a hundred million rounding up 900 to 1 billion. It's a little bit of a leap in my opinion. Is that this, is that this slide right here? Yes. 1.2 billion over the past 30 years mm -hmm. is about $40 million a year. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, Okay. Uh, do we have, can we, yeah. Do you want to incorporate other, other comments? You can. Yeah. Okay. Samantha, please. do you have any, do you have anything you want to share so far? Um, well, I mean, I don't necessarily have a problem with organizations talking about what they've given to help people. In theory, it might inspire people to, you know, give more to the poor, but it does just feel like PR 101. Like we know that the church spent the same amount on humanitarian work for 30 years as it did building City Creek Mall. We know that they give less of a percentage of their income to humanitarian work than Walmart and, you know, these other multi-billion dollar companies. Like, you can't be a multi-billion dollar company and not give at least this much. Um, I'm also curious to know, because I'm all about effective altruism, I'm curious to know what, what that money went to, how much the numbers potentially could have been fudged, because I don't have a lot of, um, you know, confidence in them self-reporting. So would love to see a breakdown of how that money was spent. Now, isn't there a report like called the widow's might that's circled around Reddit that talks about how it's been theorized that that money isn't cash given, but instead they, they found a way to estimate mm -hmm. volunteer labor of the members and to put a, a number, a dollar sign value to the aggregate volunteer efforts of the members over a year. And that that number could be drastically inflated with those types of like management consulting calculations that actually isn't them dipping into their war, their hundreds of billions of dollar kind of war chest. Is, am I getting that wrong? Harada? That's a report that, you know, some people claim. Okay. Um, you didn't mention that though. We've mentioned it before. So I'm we, curious. Yeah. Um, I try to tend to just go with whatever they tell us, you know, if they say they gave 900 million, let's believe them. Okay. Um, I get, I did get upset that he made the leap to 1 billion. Okay. But yeah. That's okay. my take. But yeah, the widow's my report is out there. If anyone wants to check it out. Okay. We'll have uh we'll make sure and include that in the show notes. Um, uh, ne Nemo. Do we, yeah. we want to do we want to give you a chance to kind of jump in? I mean, that's not the first time the church has made a leap to a slightly higher number, thinking it will make things look better. We only have to point to the gospel topic essay and talking about Helen Mark Kimball being several months shy of her fifteenth birthday to right. see that the church will try and jump to a larger number if they think it's going to help them. Um, that aside, I mean, if you go, there's a slide on there where I break down what those numbers actually mean uh, in real terms. If you take the church also at face value on the number of members they have. Uh, if you want to throw that up there. Okay, here it is. Is this it? Uh, it's Remember not right showing now? on my screen. Um, okay. But I've got, the, I've got the figures here, so that's fine. There we, um, go. there we go. Thank you. So yeah, the church has 16 million members. If we take that at face value, you divide 900, uh, 904 million. So it should be 906 million. That's a typo. Um, but the numbers do add up to 906. So you divide 906 million by 16 million members, you get $56.625 per member for that year. That's how much charitable uh, work was done with the members. Now, I would, I guarantee you a lot of members will look at their tithing receipts and think I paid more than that in tithing. So where does it go? Uh, as for um, the hours, 6.8 million hours given by members, uh, you times that by 60 to get the number of minutes and then you divide it by 16 million members, you get 25.5 minutes per member per year. So it's not a great deal. It sounds huge, but if you break it down to the member level, it's not a massive amount. Okay. All right. 
Samantha? It also seems worth mentioning that was it Jesus or was it just in the Bible? It says, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet as the hypocrites do so that they may be honored by men. Yeah. That feels relevant, that yeah. this was the opening talk. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and and Dad, you can you can answer this or not. I'm I'm on record talking about you on the podcast a little bit, and one of the things I've said about you is that your example of Christianity in my life was that charity is is all it's about it's all about christ-like service like that's the entire gospel and so on the one hand i think you know we don't want to be stereotypical post-mormons where we're just we can't say a good thing about the church like if the church is given 40 million that's awesome and if they're given 100 million that's awesome and if they're given 900 million that's awesome like on the one hand we can say hey good charity i guess on the other hand um you know, is it fair to ask, is it enough? And is it fair to even ask what Samantha asked, which is why is the church even opening its general conference by kind of boasting about its charitable service? Do you have a, a thought about that? And, and we're not asking you to bash on the church, just to be clear. Well, I don't understand why it was the opening session of conference, but uh, I'm sure the church, uh, the church throughout its history has been persecuted. And uh, the, uh, uh, people and individual or organizations that's been persecuted uh, has to, in a sense, stand up for itself, has to lash out at some point in time to stand up for itself. And perhaps that's what the church is doing here. It's uh, just, it's, it's leading with a left jab and a right cross. Okay. And and do you think it's against Christ's teachings to kind of boast about your your service? Yes, of course it is. Samantha was that right? It was right on point. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. But like I say, it's uh, it's probably their left hook and right cross to okay. just uh, protect itself. I think maybe a good middle ground um, would possibly be the idea that what they could come up and say is we've been criticized in the past for not being open enough with our finances or with what we spend and how we spend it. So we've produced a report on our charitable spending and that is available here. So that way they're not seen to be getting up and boasting the number, but they are getting up and standing up for themselves. As, as your dad said, they're standing up for themselves and they're putting that information out there and saying, no, actually we do do this. Um, but it's maybe it would come across in a slightly different way, perhaps. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's really an excellent point. One thing that made me, oh, sorry. One thing that made me uncomfortable was Elder Oaks, just the way he was talking about the report and saying that this is the first time the church has ever created a report and talking about, you know, the church, one of the principles of the gospel is to give to the needy and, you know, welfare and all this. He made it sound like the church has always been giving like this. And just hasn't been reporting it. In reality, we know that, you know, he he's quoted in two thousand just a few years ago saying that it was way less. You know, it was only forty million what the church was giving. So making it sound like oh the church is always giving this much, or we just haven't reported on it, um, <clears throat> is a little bit misleading and made me a little bit uncomfortable. But yeah, it was also only how many years ago was it where the general public found out how much money the LDS church had. I mean, yeah. that was pretty recent. 2019. Which also feels relevant, you know, in looking at this as a PR move. Because again, like all these companies like Amazon, Walmart, all these multi-billion dollar companies that are doing enormous damage to the earth and people, really. Um, like they all do this. They all donate that kind of percentage of their income to charity. It's just what you got to do. Yeah. And and that's that's a point I was going to bring up, Samantha. Is why why is this changed in the past few years? It's clearly because David Nielsen of Ensign Peak was courageous enough as a whistleblower to show that the church had a hundred hundreds of billions of dollars of of assets in cash, real estate, stocks, bonds, and and then the church has been clubbed over the head for a few years by how wealthy it is and how it's only using that money according to the evidence, to build a consumer shopping mall and bail out a failed insurance company. 
And there's no evidence that over the 30 or plus years that Ensign Peak has been in existence that they ever used any of that 100 plus billion dollars for charitable purposes. So I think it's fair to say, um, you know, what are the, do they have altruistic motives here? Why is it they kind of got caught with their hand in the cookie jar before uh, they started ramping it up from 40 million to, to a billion a year? Dad, dad, then, Samantha, and then Samantha, Nemo, and then Dad. Okay, well, Samantha. Also, the church pours far more money into industries that are destroying the earth and therefore harming people and, you know, like bringing about the end of our planet as we know it, just like these other industries, you know, like Amazon, Walmart. So mm, it's, you know, is that offset by their charitable contributions? I doubt it. Like the church is an enormous financer of like the cattle industry, big pharma, all kinds of industries that are doing a lot of harm to people. So okay. it, I would like to also see their investment portfolio to be, you know, more planet friendly, more human friendly. That's fair. Nemo, you go next. Yeah, I mean, we did get a talk from... Uh, Bishop Corse of the presiding bishopric talking about being good stewards of the earth and stuff. So um, if he can then get that in his position as presiding bishopric, he does have some financial responsibility. So you would hope that would maybe bleed over then into the church's investment decisions. Um, but uh, what I was going to say was that on the point of effective altruism, uh, you look at people like Will McCaskill and others who kind of look at the ways that we can do charitable giving most effectively. And one of the most effective ways you can do charitable good in your life is to get big organizations to do good with their money because they've got more money than you will ever have. And so I'm if the public pressure around Enzyme Peak is what's caused the church to ramp up in charitable donations, if that's what this 906 million represents is a ramping up in their charitable giving. And if some of that's come from public pressure, then good. I think that public pressure has done its job and it could continue to do its job because if the church feels scrutinized to do more, I don't really care what their motives are as long as they are doing more charitable work, if it is truly charitable work they're doing. And that's, that's good. And, and while we're on it, let's, I think this slide, I'm going to go to you dad in just one second, but let's go to the slide. Does this slide kind of visually show what we're talking about Nemo or Gerardo? Do either of you want to comment on the slide? Yeah. Well, I mean, it does show the 40 million, uh, the $40 million uh, that Hinkley, Hinkley mentioned that around 2000, I, I believe 2005, um, maybe earlier, that it was around that amount. And then we have another confirmation of Oaks around 2016 that it was around $40 million what the church was giving. Uh, so yeah, that. and then the red on the chart represents the Inside Pink Fund uh, of the information we have and how we went from $40 billion in 2012 uh, to $100 billion in 2019. Um, and then... You know, you have the nine hundred million dollars in donations in twenty twenty one that the church is claiming against the hundred billion dollar fund. And for those who can't see the visual difference, Roberto, just explain that to the listeners what the visual difference is. Yeah, I mean it's huge. It's it's like uh less than you know, like one percent <laughs> yeah. of 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 the of just that ensign peak fund that is the only one we know about, you know, but we know that they yeah. might have other funds. Yeah. And so dad, I want to get you in here, but I, but I, but I want to start by just you know, while we're on it, asking you if it's true that we have hundreds of billions of dollars in assets. Um, you know, if you look at that chart and the difference between what our assets are, what our income is and what we're giving, even if we're giving 900 million, is it fair to ask, are we giving enough? I think that's always a fair question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think here you can ever give enough. I will say this though, having just come from war torn Florida, uh, where the whole state was ripped apart uh, by a ferocious hurricane, uh, the first trucks on the scene were it was, wasn't Red Cross, it uh, wasn't United Nations, it wasn't anybody else. It was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Their trucks were first on the scene. I, I will say that. And from from what you saw, around. are you saying in Palm Coast or where 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 were you seeing those trucks? Down in uh, in Lakeland, Florida, where where the where the hurricane hit. Okay, all right, that's good. good. All right. Was that the main comment you wanted to make, Dad, or was there was there other? No, that's the main point. Okay, Orla okay. Orlando was just beat to death, and 
and our and our trucks were there for whatever it's worth. So kudos to the church. Nemo, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in regards to the hundred billion, if you're struggling to get your head around these numbers, I always recommend people go on a website called Mormon Billions, which helps you visualize the the size of the sum because these numbers can very easily become meaningless and lose all sense of scale because they're just so large um so that's a website that's worth checking out okay all right well i think we've covered this topic um i think uh let's go ahead and switch to the next topic now uh does anyone want to give a history a brief history of the for the strength of the youth pamphlet or or should i is anyone ready to do that you can you can do it. All right. Well, uh, what? So for several decades, there's been a pamphlet available to youth called for the strength of the youth. I'm sure it's gone through revisions over time, but I think it's famous for saying things like don't have multiple earring piercings if you're a woman. Don't do anything romantically that would arouse the passions. Dating. Uh, da you know, when you're dating, uh, probably probably 16 years. Yeah. 16 don't year don't date till you're 16. Women dress modestly. Any of you else want to throw in your memories of what, what For the Strength of the Youth pamphlet meant to you growing up? Don't go out with curlers in your hair. Women don't dress like men. Okay. Some classics from old pamphlets. Uh, tattoos. Uh, Did you already mention that? Didn't mention tattoos. Yeah, no tattoos. Okay. Um, music. Yeah, what yeah. Kind of music you listen to. Okay, music, dancing. What you know, about? Uh, I'll have a table of contents in one of the slides. Oh, that's going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So the point is, is one of the big announcements was they made a major change to the for the strength of use pamphlet. And I'll give a shout out to Dr. Julie Hanks because she leaked some of these summary points just a few days before, and I don't know where she got it, but she did leak some of these changes before the, the actual um, announcement was made. That's awesome. But, um, but let's go ahead and should we go to the video or? Yeah, do I did want to say that there, there has been a, for the strength of youth pamphlet since I, if I understand right, the sixties, um, there was one in, during the sixties, there was one in the nineties. And then in the early two thousands was when uh, the other, like the one we were using uh, was released um and then just this just new one from 2022 so okay or in earlier versions they were very similar to the 2000 version uh you know very sim i i looked them up i didn't include the screenshots but very similar table of contents very similar messages in the 90s you had more things like samantha said like women you can't like women shouldn't dress manly they should dress you know like feminine and stuff like that 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 2000 version didn't include uh but uh my that's my understanding but anyway and one thing yeah. we didn't mention is what it historically has said about lgbt people did it is that yeah. is that worth mentioning yeah it's soft from what it said about homosexuality in the 90s version it softened in 2020 a little bit and now it's a lot better but but historically what types of things did it say I, that it was uh it was it was an abomination. So that types of words, very similar to the miracle of forg forgiveness, was the wording uh, on the for the strength of youth pamphlet. Okay, got it. All right. So now should we jump to the video clip? Is this is that next? Yes. Is that Uchtdorf? This is Uchtdorf announcing the for the strength of youth pamphlet. Is, is it is it safe to say that like we haven't been hearing a lot from Uchtdorf since he was demoted from the first presidency yeah. when Elder um, President Nelson took over and was replaced with down and jokes. Is it safe to say that maybe this was a special project given to Uchtdorf and that's why he was the one announcing it? <laughs> Could be. Yeah. I was listening to the talk of Elder Uchtdorf last night and my husband served in Germany. So he's heard all kinds of stories about Elder Uchtdorf and stuff. And he said, it's so interesting to hear how different Elder Uchtdorf just sounds compared to other apostles or even Russell M. Nelson, like he just focused on Jesus and your relationship with Jesus and not rules. And we'll, we're going to hear it, but just so not even mentioned of mentioning of covenants from what I remember, um, you know, that Russell M. Nelson likes to talk a lot about the covenant path and the covenants you do with God and keeping the covenants. And it's just more about your relationship with Jesus and, you know, is it, very different, yeah. but we're going to hear it. Nemo, were you going to say something really quick? Yeah, I was going to say that basically he went through listing all the things, nice things that Jesus would say to you if he were there. And he presents Jesus as this very loving figure. And then um, 
the, the my only other opinion really is he is the only apostle that could have given this talk. I think he's the only one of them that you could take this from credibly because it's in his wheelhouse to soften these things and make them less strict, less rigid, less pharisaical, less rules focused, which is exactly what this new pamphlet is. And that's very much the Uchtdorf approach. R really quickly, dad, I saw you nodding when Gerardo was talking about Uchtdorf. Do you, do you have feelings about Uchtdorf as his vibe? Well, is yeah, there's no, I don't, I don't think there's anybody. I don't recall in many, many years in the church, somebody that's more Christ-like than Uchtdorf. Mm. And uh, I don't want to speak evil of the, of the Lord tonight, so I won't say anything more than that. <laughs> but uh, no, he's definitely been missed. Yeah. So you're an Uchtdorf fan, Dad. Absolutely. All right. Have, the, have that be on the record that my dad, David Joel DeLynn, is a fan <laughs> of Dieter Uchtdorf, Elder Uchtdorf. Okay. Well, let's jump to the video. And let's see, let's hear it from Uchtdorf's own, uh, <clears throat> own lips. To help you find the way and to help you make Christ's doctrine the guiding influence in your life, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has prepared a new resource, a revised version of For the Strength of Youth. For over 50 years, For the Strength of Youth has been a guide for generations of Latter-day Saints youth. I always keep a copy in my pocket, close to my heart. And I share it with people who are curious about our standards. It has been updated and refreshed to better cope with the challenges and temptations of our day. The new version for, for the strength of youth is now available, now, today online in 50 different languages and will be a significant help for making choices in your life. Please embrace it as your own and share it with your friends. This new version of For the Strength of Youth is subtitled A Guide for Making Choices. To be very clear, the best guide you can possibly have for making choices is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the strength of youth. So the purpose of For the Strength of Youth is to point you to him. It teaches you eternal truth of his restored gospel, the truth about who you are, who he is, and what you can accomplish with his strength. It teaches you how to make righteous choices based on those eternal truths. It's also important to know what For the Strength of Youth does not do. It doesn't make decisions for you. It doesn't give you a yes or no about every choice you might ever face. For the Strength of Youth focuses on the foundation for your choices. It focuses on values principles, and doctrine instead of every specific behavior. The Lord, through his prophets, has always been guiding us in that direction. President Nelson is pleading with us to increase our spiritual capacity to receive revelation. He is inviting us to hear him. He is calling us to follow him in higher and holier ways. And we're learning in a similar way every week in Come, Follow Me. I suppose the guide could give you long lists of clothes you shouldn't wear, words you shouldn't say, and movies you shouldn't watch. But would that <clears throat> really be helpful in a global church? Would such an approach truly prepare you for a lifetime of Christ-like living? Bill Smith said, I teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. And King Benjamin told his people in the Book of Mormon, I cannot tell you all the things whereby ye may commit sin, for there are diverse ways and means, even so many, that I cannot number them. And King Benjamin went on to say, but this much I can tell you. Watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words, 
and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in the faith of our Lord even unto the end of your lives. Is it wrong to have rules? Of course not. We all need them every day. But is it wrong to focus only on rules instead of focusing on the Savior? Okay, so there's so much there. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to begin with something that's kind of structural. And, um, and it's, it, it's not about the substance of his talk. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's more about, um, about this idea that, um, sorry, my dad's getting up. Uh, uh, Nemo, we're going to cut to you really quickly because my dad's getting up from his chair. So Nemo. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. Go that's ahead, fine. Nemo. I can talk, I can talk all about Uckdorf all day long. It's a well-known fact. I've got a bit of a man crush on Uckdorf. So, <laughs> yeah. um, it's not just the German speaking that, that, you know, it's, it's more than that, it's but the good looks. <laughs> it's the good looks. It's what I aspire to be. Um, I think I, I, I think with a lot of leaders of the church, when they talk about Christ, it could be synonymous with the church and therefore us as your leaders. Obedience to Christ, you know what they're really saying is obedience to us. With him, I feel like it's different. I feel like, I don't know whether it's because he's got that convert energy. I don't know whether, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, but it, it seems very different and it seems a lot more authentic when he is talking about Jesus. And so that comes across even when he talks about living a Christ-like life. Uh, or a lifetime of Christ-like living, not a lifetime of Christ-like service. Because to others, Christ-like service sounds like charity work. But in Mormon lingo, Christ-like service really means church responsibilities. That's kind of, uh, that's what I get from that. Okay. All right. Um, was so, that enough filler for you? No, that was great. That wasn't filler. <laughs> that's always, it's always high quality stuff. Um, my dad just went to go. Uh, either sit down or rest or a potty break, but we'll see if we get if we get my dad back. But um, we're we're glad he was able to join us for how much he was. Um, all right, so structurally, um, I, I guess I guess I wanted to begin by just asking, um, you know, there's this there's this idea that um, when you know we're led by prophets, seers, and revelators, and uh, he he makes this point. You know, would a bunch, would a huge old list of do not do's, you know, be helpful in a global church? It's like, you tell us, you issued them before. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, like, haven't we been a global church since like the 50s? Like, and if God is omniscient and if his prophets are talking to God, like, what couldn't God have said, don't give a big old list of do not do's 20, 30, 40 years ago? That was my first question. Which, which is, I don't want to sound curmudgeonly because I think this this pamphlet overall is a is a big step in the right direction, and I think the church should be rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. But but is it fair to say <clears throat> that if we're really led by prophets, seers, and revelators, number one, the church should have gotten this right decades ago. Number two, is this really God, or is this modern day social media people bludgeoning the church with how cult some would say cult like these things like your hair length and your number of piercings and tattoos. Is this the church responding to social media pressure or is this the church, you know, being led by God with prophets? So Harada, I'll let you go first. Yeah. Are these well, fair questions or are they curmudgeonly? They're fair questions. Cause it's like every person who, uh, you know, were asked to follow these guidelines as if there were commandments and inspired by God, then what, you know, like, they were not inspired by God. And if they were, why, why are they not there anymore? You know? Yeah. It, it just bears the question of, you know, does that mean that these were just all man-made uh, the whole time? And that's why we're getting rid of them. Yeah. 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 Samantha? Obviously the standards have been man-made this whole time. And I think we can celebrate that there's a loosening of that rigidity but and as much as I like, I want to like Uchtdorf, you know, he's the most likable of all of them. That was a very whitewashed way to talk about these changes, <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, again, the church was the one who issued these very rigid standards. And they caused untold damage to especially women and LGBTQ people like the 
the devastation that the Strength of Youth pamphlet has caused throughout the years, the damage it's done on people's psyches, the damage it did on my psyche, just as someone who willingly joined the church at 17 and left at 22, the amount that it affected my relationship with my own body, it, it was massive. And so to Can just- Can you give a tiny bit more explanation for how? To, to be, I mean, for example, you know, it, it would say- Young women should avoid short shorts, short skirts, skirts that shirts that don't cover the stomachs, clothing that doesn't cover the shoulders. And then it'll be like, young men should also be modest. For women, <laughs> just being told that your body just as it is, is a perversion, essentially, is, you know, walking pornography, as leaders have said in the past, to believe that just you and your natural state are walking pornography, it's your, it's, objectification but then it leads to this self-objectification that is very hard to shake even once you like distance yourself from mormonism that like runs very deep in the psyche like that idea that if you have your shoulders out like it the the level of like self-consciousness that it brings about and the level of like it, it makes you at war with your own body you know and it makes you feel like it i mean it can and I know this is the experience of a lot of women, it makes you feel like you're disgusting or again, like your body is like fundamentally wrong. Not to mention the fact that the strength of youth in the past, you know, called homosexuality a perversion. There's so many things that have been so damaging in the past issues. So for Uchtdorf to get up and be like, what good would it do to have such rigid standards? You know, it's like, I want to hear some kind of recognition of like, we have recognized that those standards are harmful. It also plays right into rape culture. You know, this idea that, women are responsible for the thoughts of men and that if you're dressed in an immodest way that you are somehow inviting more sexual attention or you're inviting sexual objectification or you're upping the risk of being raped. Like all those things have created such a damaging culture. And we are in a moment in history now where people are waking up to rape culture and to, you know, the ways these like patriarchal dress standards feed into it. So of course it's a smart PR move for them to do this. And I'm sure there's also an element of like, they think if they, loosen the rules for youth maybe youth won't leave as much which i don't really think is going to be effective but yeah it mm. was like Uchtdorf was the perfect person to deliver that message but it also is a little bit insidious to just present it as just like some fun new update that is so you know wonderful in all these ways and to, and to not again i mean just like with russell m nelson getting up and being like abuse is bad it's like there's no recognition of like the ways that you created a system that deeply harmed people Beautiful. So well said. Yeah. He kind of frames it as, well, times have changed. And so now God's updating his pamphlet, but I think these changes could have avoided a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. And I think your point, Samantha, is it, it probably deserved more of an apology than a rebranding and a whitewashing as just God's, God's ongoing revelation. He's updating this. Gerardo, <laughs> can, can you speak to the damage to the LGBTQ community that, that, in your opinion, this pamphlet may have contributed to? Yeah, well... Is that I, real or is that... I think it's real. I think everyone that read it, you know, who were LGBT would, would have thought that there is something wrong with them because it would say things like, go talk to your... If you are experiencing this things, go talk to your leaders, go talk to your parent, talk to your parents, you know. Um, these things are a, a grief just egregious sin and stuff like that um and you know just the fact that he had like a special section as highlighting who you are and calling it sin and calling you out for it telling you that you need to out yourself to your parents in order to be good for god with god you know for some people it's not safe to come out to their parents and then this pamphlet was encouraging people to do so and you know what happened I mean, for me, my parents uh, found out about me, but, you know, and, and I, that caused me to go in, into conversion therapy because they, you know, encouraged me to do that. And, but so many, so, so many other kids who might have followed this counsel of going to their parents who ended up in conversion therapy and damaging practices, you know, <laughs> it's like what Samantha was saying. It's just, these things that this pamphlet said was have caused ha real harm in people and to just come out and say like, Oh, this is a new brand, like cute update that we did with new colors uh, to accommodate for a worldwide <laughs> church. Um, yeah. It does. It doesn't, 
cut it. But I mean, I'm glad they're doing the change. Yeah, too. The um, Neil, I want to bring you in, but yeah, yeah. I'll ask you something direct, Gerardo. Like, you know, we all know that the Miracle Forgiveness book by Spencer W. Kimball is has caused untold psychological damage and even death for generations. Is yeah, and we also know that you know over the past. 15 to 20 years, there's been a huge spike, even doubling or tripling of the death by suicide rate of Mormon LGBT youth. Is it too much to say that kind of the, the historically the for the strength of the youth pamphlet has kind of been the on ramp to the LGBTQ youth crisis within Mormonism? Is that overstating that or is that I, I would say so, because that's probably that has been considered for a long time, or at least it was for me. And I, I'm sure many other people as, you know, an extension to scripture. So whatever it says there, said there was considered to be inspired. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's modern day prophets right. in, instead of like old scripture stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nemo, uh, what's your views really quickly or experience on the yeah. damage, on the damage of the pamphlet? On the damage of the pamphlet, well, I think the damage is going to still be done, even though they've changed it. So I think you've got a situation here, like that old parable of the elephant and the rope. So you tie an elephant up when it's really young by a fairly thin rope, and it won't go any further. And then you have a full, as it grows and grows and grows, and you keep tying it, and then you end up with a fully grown elephant who's still tied up by a flimsy piece of rope that he could break, but just doesn't, um, yeah. because that's what he's used to. And that zeitgeist around things like tattoos, around second piercings, around modesty standards, that's not just going to disappear overnight just because Uchtdorf got up and said, oh, we've got a new pamphlet now. Yeah. Youth, uh, if they go and get tattoos now because they feel like they want to for whatever reason, you know, they lost a loved one, they get a tattoo to remind them of that person. They feel spiritually, personally, that it's a good thing to do as the book encourages that they counsel with themselves about this. They're going to get an old woman in the ward judging them, giving them looks. Mm -hmm. It's going to be uncomfortable for them. It's going to be difficult. They come in wearing slightly shorter skirt than they would normally because now that's okay it's seemingly this is all still in the milieu it's all still in the zeitgeist so it's not going to go away overnight and then when it does because the church hasn't come out and rectified the old one and said no that's no longer the standards this is they've just added rather than kind of switched off the old one it's going to get to a point where people explain that away by going oh well, they were just extreme members that said you couldn't drink coffee or they were just extreme members that said i don't think coffee's included but you couldn't have tattoos you couldn't have piercings they were just the extreme ones no one ever really said that and it, it we will self gaslight because they haven't set a clear record that this is a change not just an update or more revelation um i think that's a problem and then just a question to your point john when you said about um why did God set these strict rules and standards and then no more of that? The church, the name of the Mormon church for a long time was homogeneity, was all being the same, dressing the same, looking the same, acting the same, talking the same, which you can call it cult behavior, but you can also just call it standard homogeneity and, and tribalism and groupthink and people trying to come together. Why does God not seem to want that anymore? We've had a lot of talk about diversity now. A lot of the gloves are coming off. And my question is, why would the God of the Mormon Church, why now, why 2022, does, is God not so interested in homogeneity anymore? Yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> I thought Coco B writes, I remember when it was no longer the standard to have to wear nylons to church. I was told in 2007 that if I was going to be around a general authority, I would have to wear nylons. That's an interesting quote. Samantha, you got big eyed there for a second. No, I just didn't know about the nylon thing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. Oh, wow. Also, just the number of children whose bodies have been objectified by these standards. Because remember, this is for the strength of youth. We're not just talking about adult, you know, women or men here. We're mm -hmm. talking about children who, from a young age, were taught, like women were taught to see themselves as sexual objects that needed to, like, shield themselves from, you know, the desires of men. Again, playing into rape culture, playing into pedophile culture. Okay. Yeah, I also wonder, you know, what I think maybe we can discuss really quick. Why would they have made the change and yeah, why now? Go for it. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, I've seen the ex-Mormons talk about, you know, how this Mormon influencers um, who are in social media who are, say to, to be believers, they're not wearing garments anymore or they wear things, you know, that you know that they're not wearing their garments, which I could care less if they wear their garments or not. But it's just interesting that they pose themselves as, you know, they sometimes they pose their wedding 
videos and stuff like that. And, and they being Mormon is a big part of, you know, their uh, platform. So it's just so interesting that something that I was, uh, I, I don't know, when I was raised in, in the church and even when I went through my endowments, that's something that we were taught, you know, like you never take your garments off. You never put them on the floor. It's like, you know, stuff like that. And you take care of them because they're sacred. Um, and now you have people who have been in doubt who don't wear them anymore uh, all the time like they used to. And you ha you see, you know, youth who are not following you. They were not following the standards, but they were their platforms in social media. They were saying they were believers or Mormons. Like how much was the church looking at that and saying, OK, we just got to follow the lead of the influencers and you know, or the rest of our membership. Otherwise we're just, we're just going to be left behind. Um, and well, it's like, it's, it's like Jeffrey R. Holland said, um, he said when he was talking to some YSA in Africa, he said that the, the world is here on a cultural issue and then the church is here and then they come here and then it goes here and we spend our time doing this. You yeah. give these hand gestures, right? So they readily acknowledge that the church is always catching up on cultural issues. And I think you're right, Gerardo. I think this may just be them catching up and realizing they've lost this battle. So they're going to have to capitulate. Yeah. But, but they, they go so much effort to say they don't, they don't follow <laughs> the world standards, Yeah, but they are. And, and if it was, and if it was wrong to create a huge list of do nots, uh, if, if, if it's wrong to create a huge list of do nots now, it was wrong to do it 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Why the change? Because, you know, because Ann Romney, when she's, you know, the wife of, of the man running for president, she's not wearing her garments when she's going mm -hmm. to these presidential balls. You know, I mean, I remember that. Do you guys remember when Mitt Romney was yeah, running yeah. For president? Mm -hmm. They would show these photos of Ann and Mitt Romney at a some sort of presidential ball. And she's not wearing her garments, obviously. <laughs> Entertainers, you know, Lindsey Sterling or whoever that are doing all mm -hmm. these, like, it it's clear that the church is responding to social pressure, which, which if we believe in informed consent or just basic honesty, basic accountability, the basic teachings of repentance that the church taught us, if it was, if, if it's wrong now, it was wrong. Then if the church had it wrong, then, then they need to apologize mm -hmm. for all the pain and suffering that it caused. And they, and they're not doing that. So as much as we love Oakdorf, and this is back to your point, Samantha, he's not, He's kind of being the good. I I love Ukdorf. I want more Ukdorf, more cowbell, more Ukdorf. But he's he's kind of playing the role of the good cop to uh, the other brethren's bad cop. Mm -hmm. And there is a there is a confusing nature to the there there is almost and I don't want to put this on Ukdorf, but there is an abusive element to the good cop bad cop paradigm. Samantha, you're mm -hmm. nodding your head. Why? Well, yeah, I'm just what you said about it being abusive. Because I mean, a lot of time people people that are abusive it's they're not they don't know that they're being abusive they're not trying to be that doesn't change you know we all want to like Ukdorf, but that doesn't change the fact that like this is a very clear example of whitewashing and sweeping things under the rug with no apology and then we know that there's already been like this inevitable backlash and members saying well those standards you never had to stick to them so if you were traumatized in your upbringing by these standards that was your fault or your family's fault or your community's fault and it's like no, these standards were rigidly enforced at every level of the church, and yeah. they weren't—they weren't just guidelines. They were an on-ramp to scrupulosity for so many people. We had kids having to lift up their arms and bend over in front of adults at EFY. Women, right? Well, children, yeah. children, right. thirteen-year-old girls. You know, right. having to do that to, because th they're being taught at thirteen that their bodies mm -hmm. are sexual. Oh, do I see cleavage? You know, adults assessing. Oops, I see cleavage on you, yeah. thirteen-year-old girl. Or, yeah. Oh, Oh, you're showing a little bit too much thigh, 13 year old girl. Is that right? Yeah. And what does that say? Children are sexual objects. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's rough. I think we've made that point. But, um, I think they're just acting like hipsters. They're, they're just acting like hipsters, right? They, they're like the people that haven't watched Game of Thrones yet. They're just waiting for it to not be cool anymore. And then they'll slowly sneak it in the back door because <laughs> yeah. they don't want to be seen to be going along with everyone else. So they just wait for it to calm down and then allow it. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've made that point. Thanks to all of you for helping to make the point. Um, There's a couple of slides that show the, the just the table of contents. Uh, okay. Between the so which which is this visual right so here? So this one is the old one, the 2020 version. So for those sorry, who can't, 2000, 
2000 version. So for those who can't see it, do you want to read? Yeah. So he has table of contents, agency and accountability, uh, dating, uh, dress and appearance, education, entertainment, and media, family, friends, gratitude, honesty and integrity, language, uh, music and dancing, physical and emotional health, repentance, uh, Sabbath day obedience, service, sexual purity, tithes and offerings, work and self-reliance. Uh, uh, and then... On personal... Go forward with faith. Go forward with faith. Okay, that's the old one. Yeah. Okay, and this is... Oh, wow. So just looking <laughs> at it, they've kind of cut the... They've cut the titles in half. Yeah. What? And what? Read the new one, Gerardo. Message from the First Presidency. Make insp inspired choices. Jesus Christ will help you. Love, love God. Love your neighbor. Walk in God's light. Your body is sacred. Truth will make you free. Find joy in Christ. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, that's incredibly positive, yeah. right? They're getting rid of all these heinous <laughs> sections. Yeah. And they're the, all those sections that almost like I almost heard Uchtdorf's accent mm -hmm. as you were reading those <laughs> those sections. Yeah. That's a that's a positive thing, right? For sure. For Nemo, sure. what do you think? Is that positive? That that change? I think so. Having read through it myself, I think the problem is, like I said, if you read it through the the cultural lens of a Mormon that grew up with the old one you're still going to see all the old stuff in it. You're going to see mm. implied you shouldn't have tattoos. You're going to see implied you shouldn't get second piercings. You're going to see implied the old modesty standards. Yep. But if you're a youth picking this up fresh, you may well see a different way. And particularly if your leaders approach it a different way, if they approach it the way Oakdorf approached it, then I do think it has the potential to be positive and to be freeing and to be less pharisaical and rigid. I think it's just going to take time for that to catch up. Yeah. Samantha. I remember I wrote an article for LDS Living a, a few months before I left Mormonism, and it was basically about how the church was overly judgmental about modesty, especially of women, of course. And um, I talked about how Jesus, he didn't really care about clothing from what we can gather. He just didn't care, didn't want people to be, you know, having an ego about their clothing, finding their identity in their clothing or believing that they're more valuable than someone else because of it. And I remember there was backlash on, it was still such a faithful article that I wrote. Like I was still very much in, um, but there was backlash from a lot of, especially women, because I feel like women who, you know, like middle-aged women who had been bound by these rigid standards their whole lives, the idea of them loosening, like I think for older generations, this may be kind of tough to swallow, like seeing the youth, you know, be more free in how they dress and stuff because we generally are the most um, sort of infuriated <laughs> or annoyed by people not following standards that we ourselves felt bound to our whole lives and never thought it was even an option to break. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it reminds, it reminds me of, you know, the fact that at, at BYU, when I went there, you couldn't find a, a caffeinated beverage anywhere. It was all caffeine free Coke, caffeine free, every doc, you know, everything. And then now at BYU, they can have it. And I guess on the one hand, people would say, well, John, you're being petty. That's just sour grapes. On the other hand, you know, anyway, we're, we're maybe we're beating a dead horse here. Could, I, I, sorry, go ahead. I was just curious if women could wear trousers when you're at BYU, because that used to be in the strength of youth. Women shouldn't wear pants. Definitely not at church. Mm. Yeah, no, but just generally, because it used to say you shouldn't, women shouldn't wear pants to school, to the grocery store, oh, to anything. No, when I was at BYU, women could wear pants. For yeah. Trousers, please, Sam, you are British. All right. I... <laughs> I'm wondering how much the church is doing this change to the to the pamphlet, knowing that the changes are not actually going to be enforced by their own membership and the and the local leaders yeah. until probably a generation is we're a generation away from that. I mean, that's a, that's a really important point. Like I'm thinking about just recently, I shared the Elder Holland, um, you know, the Elder Holland. Uh, MTC talk he gave in secret where he said, you know, to, to missionaries in the MTC, right. don't you dare return home early from your mission. I don't know a more pitiable, you know, group in the world than, than Mormon missionaries that return home early. Mm -hmm. And that was just like a cassette tape and a VHS tape that was just stored in bishops and mission presidents and MTC presidents offices. And then whenever a missionary 
said that he wanted to go home, it would just be pulled out and played. It was never part of any official curriculum, but I've had dozens and dozens of people say to me once I shared that publicly, oh, yep, yeah, Elder Holland, I, that, that was definitely shared with me when I wanted to go home for my mission. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of like back channel culture. Another another example is, you know, when Spencer W. Kimball outlawed oral sex in the early 80s. Yes, he rescinded that because of the backlash. But once you send something like that out, mm -hmm. like you said, Gerardo, like you said, Samantha, that's there for generations. And just some some title changes in a pamphlet isn't going to make that isn't going to make that go away. Yeah. So what what real change have we made if we don't denounce the old positions exactly. and apologize for it? It's it's kind of lipstick on a pig. It's exactly. kind of window dressing. It's kind of arranging the chairs on the deck. And you know, of the of the Titanic, you know, <laughs> as it's sinking, you know. You know what this reminds me of? The removal of the honor code uh homosexuality yeah. clause. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think they didn't they didn't expect they were expecting to for the change to be, you know, be a generation away. They were not expecting for it to be removed and having uh BYU students posting pictures kissing, you know, in front of the Brigham Young statue. So you can you can see how they're you know, managing the capital there and yeah. trying to figure out what changes can we make that we're, are not going to be necessarily immediate, but makes us look in a better light. Yeah. You know, did you have a comment? I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't uh, add some clarification, kind of like they did with the whole BYU gay honor code thing, where, <laughs> like, essentially you get a stream of Mormon youth all of a sudden going out and getting tattoos, like tattoos of the angel Moroni on their forearm or something. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're like, whoa, guys, they chill, were, out. Why not? <laughs> chill out. Chill <laughs> out. <laughs> you know uh, another example that I just came to my mind is when the church made the change that you could have a civil wedding in the United States mm, before that. you had the temple so it now that's that's technically true mainly so that the church can tell the world that that, that option's available to people yeah but inside the church we all know that the most faithful orthodox youth who choose to get married don't opt for that option yep Right? Isn't is that a fair example? That's right. Yeah. yeah. I cut my wedding short. I had I had half a wedding because we had to travel for hours to get to the London Temple because we had to be sealed the same day. And then a few months after I got married, they released this thing saying, Oh now you could just go anytime <laughs> after your wedding. It doesn't have to be on the same day. And yeah, I, I got a bit salty about that. Yeah. <laughs> All I right. have a couple more slides just to show. Yeah, so what, what's this slide about, Gerardo? Uh, so this is the old pamphlet, what it said on you, the Should modesty. we read it really quick? Or? Yeah. Okay, Samantha, do you want to read that? Uh, can you see? Can yes. you even see it? I can't see Actually, it. let's have Nemo read it because yeah. yeah, sure. I can probably see it better. Sorry, Samantha. I didn't give you a monitor that's visible. Can you read it? She can yeah, read it. Can. <laughs> can you read it? Yeah, I can. Okay, Samantha, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Um, immodest clothing is any clothing that is tight, sheer, or revealing in any other manner. Young women should avoid short shorts and short skirts, shirts that do not cover the stomach, and clothing that does not cover the shoulders or is low cut in the front or the back. Um, young men should also maintain modesty in their appearance. <laughs> young men and young women should be neat and clean and avoid being extreme or inappropriately casual in clothing, hairstyle, and behavior. They should choose appropriately modest apparel when participating in sports. The fashions of the world will change, but the Lord's standards will not change. Oh, whoops. That's absurd. They age, did. <laughs> Do What's not absurd? Saying the fashion of the world will change, but the Lord's standards will not change. It used to be a big deal for women to wear pants. Like you were making a political statement to wear a pair of jeans to the grocery store, like in the 60s as a Mormon yeah, woman. Yeah. Um, do not disfigure yourself with tattoos or body piercings. Young women, if you desire to have your ears pierced, wear only one pair of earrings. Again, I mean, even that, it's like, wh why why one pair? Because one <laughs> pair of earrings is culturally seen as so normal. So yeah. to say that these are the Lord's standards is just absurd because if the standard is to do not disfigure your body with piercings, then why even one? And yeah. let's remember that this this particular part of the piercing this was not just on the pamphlet. This was said on General Conference. Mm -hmm. And there's a clip of Gordon B. Hinckley saying that the whole Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency <laughs> teach that women should only wear one pair of earrings and no piercings. Yeah. Uh, Edna commended the lad who wouldn't marry a girl because she got a second yeah. piercing in her ear. Like, Why this... would you let that stand between you and God? Take out your piercing. So basically, yeah. when Gordon B. Hinckley said, you know, the whole Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency agree on this. They're setting it as doctrine, as the will of the Lord. And 
I mean, it was like that for for a long time, and now we can read what the strength of the the strength of the new pamphlet. If you go to the next slide, has no mention of the word modesty. So if you search for modesty, it will only appear on the index, but not on the actual content. And this is the only thing that's there about dress, uh, dress and grooming standards. Do you want to read it? Can you see it, Samantha, or do you want Nima to read it? Yeah, I can. This okay. is also interesting. What is the Lord's standard on dress, grooming, tattoos, and piercings? The Lord's standard is for you to honor the sacredness of your body, even when that means being different from the world. Let this truth and the spirit be your guide as you make decisions, especially decisions that have lasting effects on your body. Be wise and faithful and seek counsel from your parents and leaders. Okay, what's interesting about that to you, Samantha? Well, I have seen Mormon women, like current believing Mormon women, become less and less into the, these ideas around modesty. I think there is growing awareness among Mormon women that these modesty standards have been harmful and have been damaging to their psyches. And I think when women get into marriages, for example, and they still hate being naked, you know, things like that, it, you really wake up to it. I think people, like we talked about influencers, I know Amber Fillerup has been quite influential at um, she's done a number of different blog posts talking about sort of her relationship with garments and modesty. And I know there is a growing number of Mormon women who are more focused on the like, what, the judgment is the bigger problem here, not what other people are wearing in terms of underwear or clothing in general. And I also think, yeah, I think the church is becoming aware that even five years from now, this any kind of anyone dictating to women how they should cover up their body because they're, you know, inviting sexual advances from men or whatever. Like that is fully out of vogue already. And it's only going to look worse and worse as time goes on because it's already a pretty mainstream thought ish at this point that, you know, modesty culture can feed into rape culture. Couple, thank you, Samantha. Couple comments from our viewers. Tim Moore writes Members keep saying for strength of the youth is not doctrine. Uh, the language the Lord's standard is suggest otherwise. That's a good point, Tim Moore. Thank you for sharing. Our uh, beloved uh, Colby Reddish writes, my wife cried, cried when she put in her first set of earrings that looked like she had more than one piercing. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty extreme if it makes you cry. But I mean, if the First Presidency was saying that in General Conference, then it's you know, I can see why someone's crying about it. I'm, I am just kind of struck by and salty, you know, that it, that this old pamphlet said the fashions of the world will change, but the <laughs> Lord's standards will not change. Like that's outrageous. Isn't yeah, it? I'll take statements that didn't age well for 500 points, please, John. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really outrageous. And you know, it's, I think it's interesting that in the new manual, they make this statement of make sure you ask your leaders and your parents because, mm -hmm. you know, that's giving the church an out because they know that those leaders and those parents were raised with the old standards. So they know what they're going to tell their kids. And exactly. it means those people, those <laughs> leaders and those parents won't lose their faith because like people lost their faith even when like black people were allowed to have the priesthood. Like people yeah. leave the church when things change that they had been taught were, you know, standards of God. God's will. And if we're trying to be empath empathetic, the, the brethren aren't owning up to the mistakes. They're not saying we were wrong. They're not apologizing because they don't want to lose members. They want members to keep believing that they do talk to God, that they are led by God, that they are prophets, there's a revelators. And so they, they're stuck if they don't want to harm the church. They're not able to say we were wrong. They're not able to apologize. That This has been their move for decades, if not over a century. It's to make the change not to reference the past, keep it vague and ambiguous for as long as you can so that the, the old ways are, are kind of, uh, you know, still, you know, the people engaging in the old ways don't jump ship, but so the people who are engaging in the new ways can get the new message. And over time, the old generations die off and voila, it was always this way. <clears throat> yeah, that's right? the just, MO with everything. But the yeah, problem yeah. is that like, you know, children, our collateral damage in that gay people are collateral damage in that black people are collateral damage in that, you know? Yeah. And so polygamous. Don't forget polygamous. How empathetic can we really be to the, to the people in power in this situation versus the mm -hmm. millions of people that are harmed? Right. Nemo. 
this just creates that smoke screen I was talking about of plausible deniability where the church gets to say, well, it was it was the militant members enforcing it. You look back at our official uh, publications. We said this was fine, but it was those militant members that enforced it for so long. So, so all of a sudden it doesn't become about the old booklet. It becomes about the standards that were internalized from that booklet by those adult leaders. Right. Really quickly, I just want to um, I want to give a quick shout out to um, the people who are uh, supporting this this episode through the super chat. Um, Mar Mary Marine gave ten dollars. Elder Clay uh, the third gave two bucks. Uh, Kimo Lewis gave twenty bucks. You know we we do pay Gerardo and Nemo and Samantha and me for our appearances on the show. We've got all sorts of expenses here. So for those of you who are joining us through YouTube, you can always give us a super chat donation by clicking the little dollar sign in the chat window or however your browser tells you you can give a donation. We really appreciate your support that make these things happen. On Facebook, if you're joining us through the Facebook live stream, there's a stars feature that you can click on to also show your financial support. So thanks to everyone who supports us through becoming a direct donor, but also for those who support us through Super Chats. We always appreciate that. Okay, so I guess we've covered. I guess we've covered for the strength of the youth. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's let's go ahead now and jump to the next. Uh, you know, the the thing. This is one of the first things I saw mm -hmm. uh, come out of Reddit or you know the commentary on my own private Slack group. I think it was even Maven that that kind of said, "Hey, is that the first uh, black woman to speak during?" Uh, Latter-day Saint General Conference, and lo and behold, the headline. Gerardo, anything you want to start off with there? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I saw someone on TikTok saying, well, it is 2022. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's about time. And yeah, I mean, I think it's a big deal that it's the first time, you know? But yeah. Kudos to the church and also glad they're catching up. <laughs> it's so hard because... The, it, in some, if we're being fair as ex Mormons, the church is damned if they do and damned if they don't. Yeah. If they if they don't make the change, we're going to harangue them until eternity that they're not changing. And then ex Mormons, as soon as the church makes a change, it's like, well, it took a long time. Finally, <laughs> like like, it, are we? I mean, on the one hand, are we just being curmudgeons? On another hand, are we disincenting their positive change by always just? being negative whether they make a positive change or not samantha i'm going to give you the first chance to respond and then nemo it's really hard for me to feel that it's a positive change because yes obviously we want more black women speaking publicly in all spaces but it to me it feels like you know a, a teenage girl getting up and being like yeah jeffrey epstein was a great guy it's like okay we're hearing from you but it also feels like it's she's being used in the service of perpetuating the power of a racist church. So I, it's hard for me to feel celebratory about it. Also, I mean, yeah, it's insane for them to not have a black woman speak. It's 2022. It's again, like the most basic PR move they could possibly make. But yeah, it 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 does feel hard to feel too happy about it because it's like, I, I would almost, I'd rather the racism just be, I'd rather them just kind of show themselves for what they are than like, have people to be like, look, see, we're not racist. We can possibly be racist. We had a black woman speak, but it's like, okay, so then that's maybe like one thin extra layer between someone realizing like this is a horrifically racist church. Mm. Nemo, yeah. I I think it was Christopherson. Uh, I, I was gonna say in defense yeah. of the church, but I think it was Christopherson who said um, that essentially the church is changing and diversifying and this isn't some sort of forced diversity this is just the natural um byproduct of the church moving all over the world and what i i think who he was speaking to there very specifically was the right wing of the church members the the very not even politically conservative just culturally conservative members of the church who don't like the idea of uh, equality of outcome being enforced this idea that the church is specifically picking people based on their uh, identity characteristics on race of gender etc they don't like that idea they just want it to be a fair race and whoever gets to the top gets to the top that's their kind of default set psychologically so i think he's speaking to those members and reassuring them hey look things are changing black people are starting to speak at conference but don't worry we didn't enforce that it's not just because they're black hey it's just because the church is expanding because that 
membership, that part of the church, as we've seen in other issues, are willing to mobilize and are willing to be very vocal, and the church wants to keep them on side. Yeah. I, I, I guess I guess I'm now thinking about um uh you know the Salt Lake Tribune did kind of like a a, a reader poll <coughs> leading up to general conference where they they asked their their readership if you could see one headline coming out of this upcoming general conference, what would you want the headline to be? Do you guys remember what won for the headlines? Samantha, did you see it? No, you didn't see it. It, it, it said, we apologize. Oh. So for all <laughs> the possible things wow. that like smart alecky readers and viewers, because they can be snarky, right? The Salt Lake Tribune commenters can be very snarky. <laughs> of all the possible things they could say, uh, the one thing they wanted to see was, was we apologize. In other words, th this falls far short of an apology, right? You could almost say, well, you could say it's cosmetic, but you could also say, like you said, Samantha, it's it's PR 101 to make sure that you, you've got the person of color there in the slot to be representative. And it would have been PR 101 in 2001 or 1985 <laughs> yeah. or, you know, it's 2022. Yeah. They could yeah. not be later. Yeah. I, there's also the fact that, you know, the Book of Mormon still says that uh, skin of blackness is a curse or was a curse. Um, yeah. and and the book of Moses and the book of, and Abraham, the book of Abraham says Abraham, yeah. you know that the, the, the black skin came from curse of e Egyptus mm -hmm. yeah and so man yeah like <laughs> having having a, a women a black woman speaking in general conference doesn't cut out doesn't all of a sudden eliminate the racist racism in the in the scriptures yeah yeah. And let's be fair, right? She will have had to hustle to get to that position. She will have had to network, make friends, be in the right place, the right time, all this sort of stuff. Especially because there's nine slots for women at the top as general officers, right? Yeah. And this kind of undermines a lot of that because she's always going to have in the back of her mind, well, was this just because I was black and the church wanted a diversity mm -hmm. hire? And that sucks. Yeah. Well, um, I still, it's positive, right? I, I remember it was just this century, like the 21st century, I believe, where the first woman g gave a prayer in general conference. It was 2013 or 14, I think that happened. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then it wasn't until ordained women and kind of the fears after ordained women that you started seeing women sitting up on the stands at general conference and you started seeing maybe a slight increase of appearance of women auxiliary leaders at general conference so i mean i guess i guess you could argue progress. that for the church this is like this is like mock speed this yeah. this progress this general conference progress is mock speed for sure and i think it is you know there's a ton of progress for yeah. sure for strength of youth change you know like this feels different from the strength of youth change to me though just because for the strength of youth change it's like okay less rigid standards for youth that is objectively <laughs> good but with this i'm like is it just obscuring people like seeing the truth of the church yeah because this is, is an organization that is continuing to amass wealth and power like doesn't the church own a fifth of florida or something like the church is so wealthy and so powerful and obviously any multi-billion dollar organization has to do whatever it takes to like maintain its reputation but it just feels like it's all in the service of the church maintaining and continuing to amass wealth and power while harming people yeah. So this to me, like, it feels like with the strength of you thing, I can see a more direct thing of like, well, women won't be taught like such directly harmful messages about the way they dress. But then with this, yeah, it's like representation is good, but I don't know, it's so conflicting for me. JC writes, tokenism hurts. That's JC summarizing it. Kim yeah. M writes, performative. Yeah, I think it's right. And until they denounce the the explicit racism in the book of moses the book of abraham the book of mormon plus all the past racist statements by all the general authorities unless they denounce all that and change it this is just performative potentially this is just lipstick on a pig it's rearranging the chairs as the titanic sinks it's, it's i mean maybe among the most racist members of the church literally just seeing a black woman speak might actually do something now that i'm thinking this through I think for the people at the extreme end of the mm. racism spectrum, there is a chance that it could could kind of, you know, switch something up in their psyches in a positive way, maybe. Yeah. But they've been seeing black men speak for a little while now. Yeah. At least yeah. a few years. That's right. As a, as a quick fact-checking thing, um, 
Coco B reminds us something I was going to add. I think the church owns 2% of the public land of Florida. I think it's now between two and 4%, but while that's not 30% or whatever statistic you quoted, yeah. Samantha, I mean, it's massive two, two to 4% of the state of Florida. It makes the church the largest, like the political power that they have with how much, well, I mean, Utah, they yeah. run the state. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you decide let's, let, let's let the listeners decide if it's a positive move. Yeah. 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 You tell us. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Gerardo, you want to set up this next uh, this next clip? Yeah, uh, Elden. Re oh, so this one, I thought we should play the whole thing and just pause it and maybe comment on sections if anyone wants to chime in. But this talk was really uh, kind of shocking a little bit to me, just because I think the sh the church has been moving into this arena of personal revelation we we see uh you know uh people like dr julie hanks you know mentioning and talking ma making a platform and talking a lot about personal revelation and you should you know have a personal relation with jesus and ask ask jesus or god uh you know to make decisions for yourself and maybe what the prophet receives for the whole church maybe does that doesn't necessarily apply to you personally you get to decide you get to pray on what you know we've had people like patrick mason or um what's uh oh my goodness um jim bennett you know people who, members of the church who who talk about this idea of i don't believe everything russell m nelson says or you know um necessarily adhere to everything the apostles or the prophets say i i i pray to god i have my personal revelation and i decide whether something is true or not i mean we had patrick mason even going as far as to say it. he does that with scripture so um this talk kind of seems to contradict a lot of those ideas and we have Ella Renlin saying, no, whatever is contrary to what the prophets are telling you, that's not, that's, that can't, there's no possible way that that comes from God. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and roll the clip. And I'll just ask Samantha, Nemo, and Gerardo, uh, just say pause and I'll, I'll do my best to pause it because I'm running like five things here yeah. at once. All right. All right. So here's the clip of um, Elder Runland. Like many of you, I've been greatly influenced by Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf over the years. That explains, at least in part, what I'm about to say. So, with apologies to him. Well-trained airplane pilots <laughs> fly within the capacity of their aircraft and follow directions from air traffic controllers regarding runway use and flight path. Simply stated, pilots operate within a framework. No matter how brilliant or talented they are, only by flying within this framework can pilots safely unleash the enormous potential of an airplane to accomplish its miraculous objectives. In a similar way, we receive personal revelation within a framework. After baptism, we're given a majestic yet practical gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. As we strive to stay on the covenant path, it's the Holy Ghost that will show us all things that we should do. When we're unsure or uneasy, we can ask God for help. The Savior's promise could not be clearer. Ask, and it shall be given you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. With the help of the Holy Ghost, we can transform our divine nature into our eternal destiny. The promise of personal revelation through the Holy Ghost is awe-inspiring, much like an airplane in flight. And, and like airplane pilots, we need to understand the framework within which the Holy Ghost functions to provide personal revelation. When we operate within the framework, the Holy Ghost can unleash astonishing insight, direction, and comfort. Outside of that framework, 
no matter our brilliance or talent, we can be deceived and crash and burn. Pause. <laughs> the scriptures form the first element. All right, we've got a we've got a pause <laughs> request from Nemo. I'd just like to say first, it's excellent of him to mention me as he's talking about people that are talented and brilliant. Um, but <laughs> I, I this was this made it very clear. This talk is all about staying in your lane. About do don't stray out of your lane. Don't go trying to deal with things that have nothing to do with you. If you go out of your lane, then we can't help you. The Holy Ghost isn't there for you. He's basically setting very firm boundaries on the gift of the Holy Ghost um, because, you know, that's what they got to do because, heaven forbid, my Holy Ghost tell me that something they're doing is wrong, okay? Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, you know, this is one of the, this is one of the, you know, issues that I had as like a 14 or 15-year-old because, you know, when, when my seminary teacher tells me this is God's one true church and you can pray and know the Book of Mormon is true, I'm taking that really seriously. When he tells me you can go to the temple and angels will appear, I'm like, well, all right, well, I want to see that. Like, I, I'll be worthy. I'll avoid all my, all the sin so that I can reach that level of righteousness. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I start praying and as soon as I start going to the temple and fasting and trying to perform a miracle, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes 12 seconds to ask yourself, no, wait a minute. Okay, I just, I'm, I'm like stopped at a stoplight and I can go right or left, and I'm gonna ask the Holy Ghost whether I go right or left. Oh, I just got a feeling I should go right. Okay, I went right. All right, nothing happened. <clears throat> All right, was that my feelings? Was that my brain? Or was that the Holy Ghost? And and that's he is addressing one of the core epistemological, uh, epistemological problems or issues with Mormonism. Mm -hmm. How in the world do you distinguish between your own brain, your own thoughts, your own emotions, and this thing called the Holy Ghost. Oh, and he's, he gets, absolutely. He's, he's trying to lay it out as something very clear. It's like you're either in you're in the cockpit, you're in the you're in the framework, or you're out of it and you could be deceived by Satan. So, like on the one hand, I'm excited. I'm like, let's go, Elder Run. <laughs> and like I've been waiting for an answer to this question for 53 years. Right? Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm excited yeah. to hear what he's going to say. I, I haven't really listened to this yet. He's dancing through a theological minefield, and it's it's just incredible how many mines he treads on. <laughs> it's 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 incredible. I'm already ready to go off. Let's go. All right. Should we do it? Let's do yeah. it. All right. All right. Well, let's go back to Elder Runland. I wonder what he'll say. <laughs> of this framework for personal revelation. Feasting on the words of Christ as found in the scriptures stimulates personal revelation. Elder Robert D. Hale said, when we want to speak to God, we pray. And when we want him to speak to us, we search the scriptures. The scriptures also teach us how to receive personal revelation. And we ask for what is right and good and not for what is contrary to God's will. We do not ask amiss with improper motives to promote our own agenda or to fulfill our own pleasure. Above all, we're to ask Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ, believing that we will receive. All right, I got a call. A I, got, I got to call that right there. <laughs> yes, so, absolutely. Um, yeah, so two things that just jump out to my mind are, number one, he's saying... <clears throat> If the brethren have already told you, this is what I heard. If the brethren have already told you what's right, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to ask that. So, for example, if if you feel like coffee might be good for your digestive digestive system, or even just to help you get up in the morning, if you feel like two piercings are okay, if you feel like a tattoo might be all right, or not going on a mission, or dating a or, same sex or, or, relationship, yeah, yeah. If if you're not even allowed to, you're not even allowed to ask the question. Yeah, and in that sense, he's kind of like putting in a boundary. It just immediately feels, I don't know, coercive. What is it? Well, it's classic Undo high control influence. group stuff. Yeah. What do you mean? It's all high demand religions and cults teach that you know ad adherence to what the leader says. The, the leader is the ultimate authority, right? If you ever have thoughts or feelings that conflict with what the leader says, you should doubt them. But I also just think this is fascinating for him to be saying in 2022 because so much church apologetics hinges on this idea that prophets can speak as men. Yeah. So it's like, if you're alive under Brigham Young and Brigham Young's teaching that black people were less righteous in the pre to existence and that interracial marriage is a sin and always will be and you'll always be damned for doing it. And you, you know, it's apparently wrong for you to even go to God 
questioning whether that those racist teachings were okay. So it's like, again, the church with the double speak, with the trying to have their cake and eat it too. Because, you know, yeah, two piercings, whatever. But it's like the further you go back in history, the more disturbing it becomes that this is what they teach. Because the church is kind of trying to have it both ways with like, well, if anything that a prophet said was too bad, then he was just speaking as a man. Well, let's look at what the prophets have said. Horrifically racist, yeah. sexist, homophobic stuff that they need members to believe could have been sort of overridden by personal revelation because they were just speaking as men. But this, according to this, to even question the idea that black people were less righteous than the pre-mortal to existence would be going against like this talk that he's giving. So mm -hmm. it's like the consequences are more and more severe the further, you back, the further back you go and more horrific things are being taught. Yeah. What's amazing Nemo though, and is, or Nemo and Hart are jumping out of their skins. <laughs> what, what what is amazing is he goes on later in his talk to explain that it is all on the members. If 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 they misinterpret it, that's their fault, right? If he, you he, misinterpreted someone saying this yes, is what yes. <laughs> he says, we share counsel, but you are responsible for um for your own interpretation of it by the Holy Ghost. So but it's like, what would that have looked like? It would have looked like <laughs> excommunication or being killed under Brigham Young for like doubting his authority because you didn't yeah. buy into his racist bullshit. It's mental. So he does get to have his cake and eat it too because he's dancing in this this theological double speak. Double speak, yeah. And it's gonna get worse. And oh yeah, <laughs> I think something. I mean, like just like uh, Sam said, a lot of today's. Uh, Mormon apologetics there it, it's based on this on this idea that prophets make mistakes but if you if we go by what elder Rendlin is saying prophets cannot make mistakes because you have to always go with what they're saying and um Jim Bennett mentions this you know this idea that um if if uh mormon if you believe this way like elder Rendlin is 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 uh teaching then that would mean that the prophet or the apostles have been deprived from their agency that they can't choose from right or wrong they have to always choose right and that there's no possible way they can do the wrong thing or teach the wrong thing um which goes against church doctrine as well so it is very, it starts getting get very, very confusing. I'll just say for me, something that was a little bit triggering is, you know, recently we've been hearing whether it's Bednar or like a random area authority say to like persp prospective missionaries, mm -hmm. don't, they literally saying this, don't ask the Lord if you should go on a mission. You already know the answer. Or a cousin of that is um, you made the covenant when you were eight to, you know, basically obey the law of consecration and give everything. So you already made that decision when you were eight. And this is basically an apostle, Elder Runland, kind of enshrining the philosophical foundation of, of those, what I think are coercive and horrific, uh, you know, uh, teachings. It's kind of enshrining this in the cloak of apostolic authority. Mm -hmm. And I think that's deeply dis disappointing and problematic. And it comes back to something I just constantly think about, which is like, if you were a member of the church, when I keep using racism as the example, I just feel like it's the strongest one. But if you were a member of the church under someone like Brigham Young, who was teaching horrifically racist things as like, thus saith the Lord doctrine, and you didn't, you, you couldn't go along with that. You felt in your heart that that was wrong, that that was terrible. You would get kicked out of the church. So then it's like, God restored this church to just have a bunch of people who are like morally weak, you know, that would just go along with what a guy is saying because that's what they're supposed to do. Like then what was the point of restoring the church if the people that are going to be staying in the church are people that are willing to go along with things that we now know to be horrifying? Same with polygamy or, you know, any other issue. Yeah. D does anyone remember the second point? Renlund made two points in that intro one was don't ask questions outside the cockpit, basically. What was, does anyone remember the second point? I, I, I'd probably put people on the spot. I, I was going to say two things and I lost the second. So anyway, that's fine. Should we just go on? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go on to uh, the talk continuing. Element of the framework is that we receive personal revelation only within our purview and not within the prerogative of others. In other words, we take off and land 
in our appointed runway. The importance of well-defined runways was learned early in the history of the Restoration. Hiram Page, one of the eight witnesses to the Book of Mormon, claimed to be receiving revelations for the entire church. Several members were deceived and wrongly influenced. In response, the Lord revealed that no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant Joseph Smith, until I shall appoint another in his stead. Doctrine, commandments, and revelations for the church are the prerogative of the living prophet who receives them from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the prophet's runway. Years ago, I received a phone call from an individual who'd been arrested for trespassing. He told me it had been revealed to him that additional scripture was buried under the ground floor of a building he tried to enter. He claimed that once he obtained the additional scripture, he knew he'd received the gift of translation, bring forth new scripture, and shape the doctrine and direction of the church. I told him that he was mistaken, and he implored me to pray about it. I told him I wouldn't. He became verbally abusive and ended the phone call. I didn't need to pray about this request for one simple but profound reason. Only the prophet receives revelation for the church. It would be contrary to the economy of God for others to receive such revelation, which belongs on the prophet's runway. There it Personal is. revelation rightly belongs to individuals. All right, so really quickly, there were some smirks and some audible gasps. Gerardo, <laughs> you want to start? Yeah, you know, there we go. The, <clears throat> he just said, you know, the prophet is the only one that receives revelation from God for the entire church. No one else can. And everything that he receives and he gives us is correct. If anyone comes and tells you that the prophet is wrong, they are wrong because the prophet is always right. And... I mean, there's no way then, like, what about fallen prophets? You know, what about David in the Bible? You know, that apologists love to mention prophets in the Bible that may mistake, make mistakes and that God, you know, chastise them and takes them out of their position. For if, if you go with what he's saying, there's no way for that to happen. So I'm hearing a slightly different Gerardo. I'm hearing him saying, if revelation is going to come for the church, it's not going to come from some rando claiming to find scripture under a stairwell it's going to come from the prophet i'm hearing it slightly differently i think he's he's saying both both okay things. yeah yeah because because uh, we all know that if somebody disagreed with brigham young back in the 1800s they're excommunicated if anyone when oliver calvary called joseph smith an adulterer or what he finds himself excommunicated even though he's in the first presidency or co-president even though he was a translator of the Book of Mormon, you disagree with the prophet, you're out on your ear. So I think your your point is practically true, but I do think he was making a slightly different point. Well, on this story, he does say that the person who was claiming to find new scripture, uh, this person said that it was going to change the course of the church, meaning that the church was not going on the right direction. So yeah, right. You know, so oh, right, right, right. So right. the new person was receiving revelation to change where the church was going, which meaning that the current prophet is not taking the church where it should be. Go. basically a uh, snuffer yeah person. Denver snuffer and, and and you know to me what comes to my mind being raised Mormon is this don't steady the ark that you, if, if, if you notice that the ark is falling you try and steady it God's going to strike you down yeah it's it's the Lord's anointed's job to, to steady the ark Nemo is there something you want to add to this point oh yes there is Okay. Absolutely. Can we just, I mean, we could spend an hour, oh, I certainly could, talking about the phrase, the economy of God, right? <laughs> <laughs> he said those words. <laughs> and and that indicates this idea that God is not the author of confusion. God would not have multiple people receiving revelation for his church. That would create too much confusion. It would stop the, the linear progression of God's church. That is anything but linear because God's constantly having to revoke random things that some prophet said. He's having to take blood atonement out of the endowment. He's having to take Adam God theory out of the endowment. He's having to reverse a policy three years after it was instituted that punishes children for the action of their parents. 
He had to reverse in nine months the ban on oral sex because members of the church were livid. <laughs> the economy of God. <sighs> Sorry. I'll yeah. read myself and read. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's hard because... You know, I I once kind of reduced it to how do you, how do you know the prophet speaking for God? His mouth's moving, right? Like uh, how you just it's you know, but but also this whole stay in your lane thing, like it, you know, it, it really does tie the hands. What 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 has what have the brethren? What is the church not? If they've talked about what underwear you wear, if they've talked about number of earrings, length of your hair, what you can and can't drink or eat. They, they, they've told you how to live your life. So what is left? Really, what is left that the prophets haven't spoken about? What can any lay member claim as their purview that the prophets haven't already weighed in on? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing left for the members to be individual about because the prophets have already yeah weighed in on all of it. They've weighed in on all of it. Yeah. Well, there just comes a point where it's difficult to even <laughs> legitimize this stuff enough to respond to it intelligently because it's just such textbook cult tactics of just like, listen to the prophet. What does the prophet say? Keep following me. What do the leaders say? Keep following us. It's just like this massive loop. Yeah, it's like this revelation, Joseph Smith, God going, God says the only person <laughs> that can get revelation for the church is me. Sorry, guys. God said. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like what I'm pretty sure every prophet since the church was founded has taught something that, like, as doctrine that the church now disavows. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we could. This is really triggering, so that we could go on this for days. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but we'll we'll jump back in, Elder Redmond. Let's let him continue. You can receive revelation, for example, where to live what career path to follow, or whom to marry. Church leaders may teach doctrine and share inspired counsel, but the responsibility for these decisions rests with you. That's your revelation to receive. That's your runway. A third element... All right, wait a minute. Framework. I got to I gotta throw a flag revelation. there. I got to throw a flag there. Gerardo, can you choose who you want to marry? I mean, you <laughs> did list it. Say, that's what I was going to say. At <laughs> least. <it's not> that. <laughs> there you go. That's your runway, Gerardo. Off you go. <laughs> no, but can you? I mean, can you, Gerardo? No, I, well. <laughs> no, because you, the prophet said that you can't already. Yeah, exactly. He said they can't. Yeah, an, an LGBT member can't choose who yeah. they marry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's actually wrong. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, he said you can ask, you, you know, he's talking about what kind of personal revelation you can receive. You can ask God who to marry and God should tell you a, a woman, right? If you're, if, <laughs> if you're a guy, if yeah. you're a guy. yeah, yeah. It's, if, it's, if, if you receive a, if you receive an answer that says you should marry a guy, then that's wrong. That's from Satan because yeah. the prophet has already weighed on that. And that's part of the loop you're referring to, Samantha, is um, it, <clears throat> if you pray and what, what your emotions or brain tell you uh, aligns with what the past prophets or current better said current prophets are saying well then yay you got your answer <laughs> mm -hmm. but is it ever okay if you get a personal answer that's different from what the prophets seers and revelators have said in in modern mormon culture can you ever get up in in sacred meeting and say hey you know what redland said that i could pray about who i'm going to marry i'm gerardo i decided to marry zach and all the members are going to be giving you like the double <laughs> thumbs up saying oh good god spoke to gerardo and he gets to do what he wants yeah is that going to happen that's never going to happen <laughs> that's never going to happen <laughs> yeah the other thing that i'm just that outrages me is just that what's driving change it's in 2022 it's never revelation it's mm -hmm. sam young is driving changes around you know, children and one-on-one -on -one interviews and the way the church handles abuse. You know, what's making the church change around women? It's the ordained women movement and women protesting. What's making the church change, becoming more historically transparent? It's 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 post-Mormon podcasts and the CES letter and other types of things and activists. And so, you know, for the church to just claim that there is any revelation in 2022, name one change that the church has made that wasn't preceded by public, you know, just embarrassing protests 
by people in the social media or outright activists. Mm -hmm. can, can we name one? I mean, I don't think a lot of people were championing the um, homophobic baptism policy. They came up with that one on <laughs> right. their own. <laughs> right, but then, they, but then they took that back. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. And we'll be in harmony with the commandments of God and the covenants we've made with Him. Consider a prayer that goes something like this. Heavenly Father, church services are boring. May I worship Thee on the Sabbath in the mountains or on the beach. May I be excused from going to church and partaking of the sacrament, but still have the promised blessings of keeping the Sabbath day holy. Straw man. In response to such a prayer, we can anticipate God's response. My child, I've already revealed my will regarding the Sabbath day. When we ask for revelation about something God has already given clear direction, we open ourselves up to misinterpreting our feelings and hearing what we want to hear. A man once told me about his struggles to stabilize his family's financial situation. He had the idea to embezzle funds as a solution, prayed about it, and felt he had received affirmative revelation to do so. I knew he had been deceived because he sought revelation contrary to a prophet, contrary to a commandment of God. Freudian slip. Prophet Joseph Smith warned. Wait, what's that? What's that, Nemo? Nothing. Freudian a... slip. I, I missed it. What was the Freudian slip? Oh, he said uh, revelation contrary to a prophet of God, but he really means contrary to a prophet. Okay. Absolutely. That is, that is what he intends. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. All right. He was, he was just about to tell us what, what Joseph Smith, <laughs> what Joseph Smith said. Uh, let's let him tell us what Joseph Smith said. The greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the spirit of God. Some might point out that Nephi violated a commandment when he slew Laban. However, this exception does not negate the rule, the rule that personal revelation will be in harmony with God's commandments. No simple explanation of this episode is completely satisfactory, but let me highlight some aspects. The episode didn't begin with Nephi asking if he could slay Laban. It wasn't something he wanted to do. Killing Laban was not for Nephi's personal benefit, but to provide scriptures to a future nation and a covenant people. And Nephi was sure that it was revelation. In fact, in this case, it was a commandment from God. The fourth element of the framework oh, man. is to recognize like, what God has got Holy me. moly, Nemo, you, you, got, you got this one? <laughs> yeah, that bloke who went running in looking for his new scripture, he may not have wanted to be there. He may have been pretty sure it was Revelation, and that new scripture could have helped the entire church. So what are you talking about, Renland? You're the same man that looked at Heavenly Mother and went, yeah, we don't know. And you've just looked at the Nephi example and gone, yeah, we're not completely sure, but I've got some ideas. <laughs> He's not doing a great job, is he? Mm. Also, as a leader of a church like this, you should be aware that there is always going to be a percentage of people who, for example, suffer from schizophrenia, who have voices kind of involuntarily come into their head telling them to do stuff. So it's like you need to be saying that the fact that it was OK to, de to kill the defenseless drunk to get the plates that weren't even used in the translation process was OK because he didn't want to do it. Like that doesn't <laughs> feel like a very strong argument because it's like mm. how, are, you know, well, people who struggle with hearing voices in their head, how are they going to receive that? Yeah. Or if you think like if Nephi was real, like if this situation was real, wouldn't Nephi be thinking like, oh, he's going to, you know, chase after us. He's going to kill my family. He's going to kill me. You know, those kind of ideas would probably be in someone's head if Nephi was real. So why is he so sure of what Nephi was thinking and wanting? Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that he brought up the Laban story. This is what I was talking about with the minefield, right? <laughs> Yeah, he's well, running through the minefield and he just treads on a mine. He's like, oh, yeah. okay, that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell you what that one was about. Got yeah, a few sorry. theories. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's obvious why he brought up Laban, you know, Laban and Nephi. You know, in 2022, we Lord just had we just had Under the Banner of Heaven, the documentary series come out where the Lafferty brothers 
feel the impression that they need to kill people. We've got Chad Dabla and Lori Vallow and all these prepper Mormons that are starting to get revelations that their spouses are going to die because they actually are getting feelings that they want to sleep with other members of their super special book club or prepper group. Like it, de death and murder is actually a relevant issue in 2022. So I think that's partly why he, he he's invoking it, but it's really problematic as someone who, uh, you know, I, I did, I, I, I did study psychology. I've, I have an advanced degree in psychology. Like, is he saying that somebody who suffers from a, a schizophrenia diagnosis doesn't really understand that the voices are, you know, aren't from, are, are from God? Like when you're hearing voices in your head, when you're getting that overwhelming feeling of uh, something is right or something is wrong, you believe it. You know, Margie, Margie once read a book that basically said, what is feeling wrong like? What does feeling wrong feel like? It feels a lot like feeling right. Like who, who, who in the world who feels justified in something doesn't feel like it's the right thing at the time. Whenever you're angry and you feel like you should punch somebody or yell at your spouse or do something abusive, you feel certain at the time that it's the right thing. Mm. So he's not yeah. giving us a, a clear litmus test at all, at all. It's, it's, it's worthless. And then the other thing is he, he says, Nephi was sure. Well, how again? So are yeah, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, but who's not sure when they really mm -hmm. feel sure? So he's given us literally nothing. It's kind of like the these are not the droids you're looking for. He's giving us some explanations as if he's just he's just really clarified everything. <laughs> and I don't think he's clarified anything. I think he's made it worse. He's made it worse. Yeah, and <laughs> he can't see the elephant in the room, which is like the same mechanisms by which people become converted to Mormonism, and I know because I did, are like the same mechanisms that can make people do other really atrocious stuff because they just become convinced. And it feels like a classic high control group response to people starting to become more emotionally self-sufficient because awareness of mental health is increasing. So what he's doing is basically just saying like, no, stay psychologically dependent on us. And he's, he doesn't, he's not talking about any of this through like a mental health lens, which like the story he gave sounds like a story of mental health in my mind. He's just like, well, you won't have any of those problems if you just follow our high control group. And, but that's not true. Like that's not how any of that works. No. Yeah. Maven makes the point uh, that, that RFM has an episode playing a tape from Dan Lafferty, Dan Lafferty, who's at the point of the mountain in high security prison, or maybe he's somewhere else in Utah, but Dan Lafferty's still sure that, that he should have killed whoever it was he killed. Mm -hmm. So it, thank you, Maven. And yeah, thank you, RFM. That's just really, really bad logic. Well, what, what he, what London is saying is, um, Nephi was right because he didn't ask to kill Laban. He wanted to preserve the plates. It, it didn't originate. He says it didn't originate with yeah. Nephi. Yeah. And so it, that's another thing. It, but it, it, that's that's called egocentonic versus egodystonic. If it originates with you, if you think it originates with you, <laughs> yeah. that's called egocentonic, and that's that's when someone's schizophrenic. Egodystonic is when you hear the voice, but you realize it's not you. Mm -hmm. But that's literally the, the difference between two psych psychological diagnoses. Is he expecting people with mental illness to be able to self-diagnose? Right. And just be, and like mm. as if the solution to something like schizophrenia is just follow the Mormon prophet. <laughs> like imagine <laughs> if that was it. We'd have no schizophrenics. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And I just I, I really want to pin that point, And it's only a simple one. Nephi was sure it was revelation. How? How was he sure it was revelation? Mm -hmm. yeah. That'd be a really helpful piece of information to have here while you're seeking to justify this. Well, it's also slightly problematic that Nephi never existed. <laughs> Well, there's that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that. that's a slight problem. Like if, if ne all the evidence points to the fact that Nephi was like made up by Joseph Smith. So should we be looking to a fictional character created by Joseph Smith as the standard of whether or not we should kill somebody? He could have written any character he wanted. <laughs> yeah. Kill a defenseless drunk. Yeah. Like three chapters into the Book of Mormon. Yeah. So anyway, we've made the point, but uh, it's an mm -hmm. important one. Because Mormonism it often is a, a matter of life and death. I don't think, I, I don't think that's an exaggerated point. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. How much more, Gerardo? Yeah, we nearly, we didn't need that yet. Well, to you personally, while being open to further revelation from Him, if God has answered a question, and the circumstances haven't changed, why would we expect the answer to be different? 
Joseph Smith stumbled into this problematic scenario in 1828. The first portion of the Book of Mormon had been translated when Martin Harris, a benefactor and early scribe, asked Joseph for permission to take the translated pages and show them to his wife. Unsure what to do, Joseph prayed for guidance. The Lord told him not to let Martin take the pages. Martin requested that Joseph ask God again. Joseph did so. And the answer was, not surprisingly, the same. But Martin begged Joseph to ask a third time, and Joseph did so. This time, God didn't say no. Instead, it was as though God said, Joseph, you know how I feel about this, but you have your agency to choose. Feeling himself relieved of the constraint, Joseph decided to allow Martin to take 116 manuscript pages and show them to a few family members. The translated pages were lost and never recovered. The Lord severely rebuked Joseph. Joseph learned, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught, seek not to counsel the Lord, but to take counsel from his hand, for he counseleth in wisdom. Jacob cautioned that unfortunate things happen when we ask for things we should not. He foretold that the people in Jerusalem would seek for things that they could not understand, look beyond the mark, and completely overlook the Savior of the world. They stumbled because they asked for things they would not and could not understand. If we have received personal revelation for our situation, and the circumstances haven't changed, God has already answered our question. I think for we example, can stop right there. Okay. We and sometimes I, ask repeatedly. And then I want to... Um, like many of you. And then I want to point out that he changed this history a little bit on Martin Harris and Joseph Smith and the 116 pages. He, so? he says that Joseph, when and inquired once, God about Martin taking the pages. God said no. He inquired twice. God said no. And then Elder Ren according to Elder Randlin, Joseph asks a third time, and God says, kind of like, do as you wish uh, kind of thing. Like, I already told you what to do, but you decide. Well, according to the history, Joseph Smith papers, uh, it says, after much solicitation, I again, and this is the third time, and this is Joseph, I again inquired of the Lord and, and permission was granted. So according to, you know, Joseph Smith, God granted him the permission the third time. It was not, mm -hmm. you know, God saying, oh, you decide what to do. <clears throat> so uh, just kind of like a slight change of history that he tried to do there to make it look like it was Joseph's fault for not following the first, uh, you know, instruction and the second instruction, uh, where according to Joseph, it was God's fault because God granted him permission. That's yeah, and don't, don't we like, don't we big up um, Jacob as one who wrestles with God, right? Don't we big up other characters that wrestle with God and really contend with him? Um, yeah, we big those people up, but all of a sudden, Joseph Smith, you know, not so great for asking God a couple of times. Yeah. And then doing what God told him, like you said, God said, yeah, okay, crack on. And he was like, all right, cool, we'll do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that again, we've made this point already, but like, what precipitated changes in the LGBTQ policy? It was protesters and activists and a bunch of LGBT deaths, basically. What precipitated the changes in abuse, the limited changes in abuse and one-on-one -on -one interviews, Sam Young and the Protect LDS Children Movement. Women, it was ordained women. Like, like he's basically saying uh, until, the stat until the prophets change the status quo, stick with the status quo, but we know that, that what makes the brethren change is people objecting and asking and protesting. And, and even, and even Joseph Smith, you could take it back to the founding of the church. Uh, 
there there was confusion. There were a bunch of churches. Well, Joseph could have just stuck with the status quo and just like joined one of the existing churches, mm -hmm. but he didn't stick with the status quo. He prayed and asked God, and then God gave him an answer. Why? Why didn't Joseph just let let things go as Jesus said? Does that make sense? Anyway, mm -hmm. Nemo, I know you've been you're you're staying late, and uh, you probably need to duck out. We're loving your contributions. Yeah. Uh, so we want to give you a final word before you have to bail. We love having you. Sure. I mean, this this conference was uh, people people ask me how why do I do a conference halftime show every year? How do I know there's going to be something to talk about? But there's always something to talk about because the church is always going to do something mental. They're always going to do something slightly bizarre. They're always going to gaslight somebody. Uh, it, it's it's par for the course. So much of this is par for the course that in many ways it's not that interesting. But a light needs to keep being shined on it or shone on it because you know it is it is important that people realize this is what's going on um so and other things to say in terms of final words i'm just i'm really happy to be here thanks for inviting me on really excited at the end of the month i'll be in utah uh shameless plug that i'm going to be in utah speaking uh, at speaking at thrive day uh at the end of the month i think that's on the 29th of October, I want to say. Uh, yeah. It's the Saturday. It's the last Saturday in October, Provo City Library. Um, so I'll see you all there. Uh, yeah, and you can go to thrivebeyondreligion.com to register. Yeah. I'm sure there's still a few tickets left. I think there is, yeah. But snap them up because uh, I'd love to see you there. And I'm going to hang out with you lovely people mm -hmm. as well. And it's going to be a blast. And Nemo, how do people um, how do people find your channel? Nemo the Mormon on basically every social media you can think of. Okay. And you're getting you're getting good growth. Uh so it's super exciting to see your growth. Yeah, it's, it's going all right. And the halftime shows have been have been very popular. So thank you to everyone that that tuned into those. And um yeah, I'm taking a little bit of a break over October and then I will I'll come back with a I'm probably gonna vlog my trip to Utah. So that'll be some slightly <laughs> different content. You can all enjoy That's seeing fun. that. <laughs> Also, please give our love to the other Brit Vengers. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm seeing them at Sunstone. Uh, I'm traveling up to Sunstone tomorrow. So Sunstone UK is happening this weekend. Any British viewers that are watching. And or um, European, Western European or anyone. Or who... Western European, yeah. Yeah. Come okay. come join in. Uh there's still spaces available. So the other Brit Vengers right. will we be. Love there. You, Nemo. Thanks, brother. Bye, Nemo. All the best. Bye. Have a good one. All See right. ya. Nemo. All right. Well, um, we don't want to we don't want to drag this on too long but we do have a couple more really important um things yeah the around. next ones are not going to be full talks like that one. they're going to be super brief all right well the next big one was something that maybe some of us could have predicted <clears throat> there was a statement about abuse and i think it's important maybe you know let's play the clip and then we'll talk about mm -hmm. why or why this may or may not have actually been a real progress let's let's roll the clip As president of the church, I affirm the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ on this issue. Let me be perfectly clear. Any kind of abuse of women, children, or anyone is an abomination to the Lord. He grieves and I grieve whenever anyone is harmed. He mourns, and we all mourn, for each person who has fallen victim to abuse of any kind. Those who per perpetrate these hideous acts are not only accountable to the laws of man, but will also face the wrath of Almighty God. For decades now, the Church has taken extensive measures to protect, in particular, children from abuse. There are many aids on the church website. I invite you to study them. These guidelines are in place to protect the innocent. I urge each of us to be alert to anyone who might be in danger of being abused and to act promptly to protect them. The Savior will not tolerate abuse, and as his disciples, neither can we. 
Hmm. Well, Samantha, you you made some really cool videos in your your reaction to this part of the talk on Zelf of the Zelf on the Shelf and your own personal TikTok and Instagram. So let's give you the first. Yeah, I feel like everyone's sick to death of hearing me respond to this, but it just feels so empty. Abuse of women and children was systemic under Mormon polygamy. He doesn't confront how the church has played a role in the abuse of women and children throughout its history. He doesn't address the fact that the founder was a child abuser, the next guy, the next, you know, all the leaders of the church for generations were grooming and coercing children into marriage and women as well, because even adult women, like these are men in a position of power and they live in a community where everyone reveres these men as leaders. So, you know, there's a power differential there, no matter what. Um, He says the church has taken measures to protect children for decades. I'd love to have heard him name them because it seems like the church sure pushed back a lot on Sam Young stuff. And then, you know, Sam was excommunicated. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We just had an AP article come out by the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who exposed the Catholic Church's cover up of child sex abuse, saying that essentially the Mormon church has been doing the same thing. So again, I mean, you can't ever really know these men's intentions. I don't know what Russell feels in his heart. I'm sure he does feel that abuse is bad. But like just saying abuse is bad with absolutely no recognition or bringing awareness to the ways that the church has like created systems that abuse women and children or allow for the abuse of women and children to go undetected is heinous to me. It just feels so empty and like insulting because it again, it's going to placate a few members of being like, see, we think it's bad, but everybody thinks abuse is bad. We all know that. We don't need to hear that necessarily. And again, like the, the the what the Catholic Church was accused of, what the Mormon Church has been accused of, is allowing child sex abuse to go on to protect its own reputation, right? And it's like that's the church's whole approach to all of this because they can't talk about how Joseph Smith was a sex abuser. They can't talk about how Brigham Young was or any of these other guys because that would hurt their own reputation. So we know, we can see from that that like they do value the protection of their own reputation over the protection of children because it would actually be extremely valuable for that i mean what would be more valuable than them speaking up about their you know how joseph smith was a hebophile and coerced and groomed children and women into marriage that would be invaluable because we know that religious hierarchies lend themselves to the abuse of children and women and people generally and so we can't the ch- people can't get better at spotting what abuse looks like if you won't call out you fucking founder doing it like it just and i know they can't because then the whole thing crumbles to the ground but it just is just pointless and empty to me and infuriating Berto? yeah i i think all i would say is uh this phrase of god doesn't tolerate abuse and we don't either um makes me a little bit upset knowing you know how Michael Resendi says the church obviously tolerated abuse for seven years on this on this on this case in Arizona. So saying we don't tolerate abuse, what does that mean? When the stake president knew, the two bishops knew, you know, probably the whole high council knew, obviously church headquarters knew, and they let it happen for seven years. So sounds very empty. And continuing to like uphold Joseph Smith's marriages to these underage girls as, you know, Mm. that was like, that is the definition of tolerating abuse. You won't name it in your profit. Like that is tolerating abuse. Like it's just empty words. Yeah. Yeah. I liked your point, Samantha, that it's not courageous in 2022 to condemn abuse. Um, saying the church has made extensive changes. There's so many changes the church could make just simply requiring background checks of all people held in callings. Uh, um, You know, this would have been an amazing chance for him to just say, always report (coughs) abuse to police authorities. Mm -hmm. We all Mm -hmm. know that that's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be bishops or stake presidents. They're deciding whether or not police, you know, investigating whether or not abuse happened and then, you know, whether whether or not it should be reported to the police. No, just report to police. But instead of him making the actual changes that would make a huge difference, mm-hmm. right? Instead of saying, hey, we've got hundreds of billions of dollars, and now it's conference time, time for a big announcement. Instead of saying, Hey, let me let me roll, let me make an apology for all the abuse victims that have 
suffered for generations and generations that we've protected their abusers at the expense of these victims. Instead of apologizing, instead of making substantive changes, he's going to announce 18 new temples and and not make any meaningful substantive changes. It's, it's hard not to say that this statement was motivated by Michael Resendez. Again, a secular, I'm assuming, journalist is, is prompting and leading you know, a, a prophetic statement, but also Kurt McConkie. It's like, Hey, we, we need, you know, it's gotta be the lawyers calling up saying, Hey, it would be really timely to have some <laughs> sort of prophetic condemnation of abuse. Now that we're getting bludgeoned in, in the press as being protectors of abusers. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard on the one hand. Yay. You condemned abuse on the other hand. Oh my gosh, this is just, it's not, it's not enough. It's, it's awful. It's yeah. Always. Brigham Young said monogamy is no part of the economy of heaven. And we've only ever seen Mormon polygamy be inherently abusive to women and children. So what does that say? God does tolerate abuse. Or everyone in Mormonism did it wrong, in which case it feels like God should issue a little statement about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we can just keep going, but uh, we need to end at some point. Nemo said... <laughs> This will be the one Mormon Stories episode that's shorter than his. We're going <laughs> we're to make Nemo but a false he prophet. doesn't know John. <laughs> you know, oh, it's all me? Is this all me? <laughs> all right, Samantha. We got Somebody do a time count of, of, of who's talked the most. I'm not sure it's going to be me, but maybe it will be. Maybe it will well, be. you go too easy on them, so I go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, the, next, uh, the next clip is entitled, uh, Satan Has Other Tactics. Let's see what Satan's other tactics are. The adversary has other disturbing tactics. Among them are his efforts to blur the line between what is true and what is not true. The flood of information available at our fingertips, ironically, makes it increasingly difficult to determine what is true. This challenge reminds me of an experience Sister Nelson and I had when we visited a dignitary in a country where relatively few people have heard of Jesus Christ. This dear aging friend had recently been quite ill. He told us that during his many days in bed, he often stared at the ceiling and asked, what is true? Many on earth today are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. Some would have us believe that truth is relative, that each person should determine for himself or herself what is true. Such a belief is but wishful thinking for those who mistakenly think they will not also be accountable to God. Dear brothers and sisters, God is the source of all truth. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints embraces all truth that God conveys to his children, whether learned in a scientific laboratory or received by direct revelation from him. All right, Gerardo, why'd you pick that clip? It seems like um, in recent general conferences, there's always this talk about uh, President Nelson talking about, um, you know, what it's true and not believing what the media says, not believing what social media says, uh, you know, talking about information at our fingertips and the internet. Um, just to be careful, which I think generally it's a it's good advice. But then later he he says that you know truth only comes through <clears throat> truth will come through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. You know God reveals the truth to its prophets, and the Church embraces all truth. So whatever the Church believes is what is what you can can consider to be true, and whatever mm -hmm. the Church does not believe, like evolution. Uh, which he's on record saying he doesn't believe in evolution and he's the prophet, you know, then you can just discard that and, 
be sure that that's not true. So, yeah, just this interesting, uh, you know, it seems like it's repetitively in every general conference. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was pretty interesting to talk about it. Yeah. Samantha, you want to add anything? Well, didn't, it, didn't he also say in that talk that uh, the church accepts all truth, whether it comes through a scientific laboratory? Yeah. Or, yeah. And it's like, well, you don't. You don't accept <laughs> DNA science. You don't. Ex apparently, you don't believe in evolution. Yeah. Global so, flood, again, this, global it's flood, just Tower of Babylon. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, th that, that's what I wrote. The church absolutely does not accept all science as, as it relates practically to the church's truth. Anyone rights. can say that, like, my truth is the truth, and, yeah, that science is actually bad because I said so, but it doesn't mean anything, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to the Redland talk, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. kind of an epistemology talk. Yep. But it's just re re reasserting the idea that follow the brother. Because whenever they say God is the source of all truth, follow exactly. God— well, how? I mean, how do any of us know what God's really saying? Oh, oh, the Mormon prophets are telling us what God said. So really what he's saying is... And how do we know they're speaking for God? Yeah. Funny feeling. That their mouths are moving, <laughs> right? Yeah, but don't follow the old... The old Mormon prophets follow the current Mormon Don't even prophets. read what they said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we're being repetitive now, but it's just... He, he's really saying follow the prophets, right? Yep. And and it it it's it's very obvious that if they've been wrong, if Mormon prophets are wrong about polygamy, they're wrong about black people and the priesthood. If they're wrong about LGBT people, if they're wrong about the word of wisdom, what are they wrong about now? So it's just a it's just a trap. It's a problem. All right, Saturday evening, Gerardo. Do you want to set this one up? Yeah. So uh, this first, uh, and I promise there's. Not that many left, but okay. uh, this is uh, on this talk. Elder Suarez mentioned women and men in marriages, which I thought it was kind of interesting what he mentioned because it slightly contradicts the family proclamation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you just want to play the clip and we just. I don't have a Suarez uh, oh, video. Just go to the next. Go to the, the next slide. one. Yeah, women sorry. and men in marriage. Yeah. Okay. From that point on, they move forward interdependently and in full partnership with the Lord, especially in regard to each of their divinely appointed responsibilities of nurturing and presiding in their family. Nurturing and presiding are interrelated and overlapping responsibilities, which means that mothers and fathers are obligated to help one another as equal partners and share a balanced leadership in their home. To nurture means to nourish, teach, and support family members, which is done by helping them to learn gospel truths and develop faith in Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in an environment of love. To preside means to help lead family members back to dwell with, in God's presence. This is done by serving and teaching with gentleness, meekness, and pure love. It also includes leading family members in regular prayer gospel study, and other aspects of worship. Parents work in unity, following the example of Jesus Christ, to fulfill these two great responsibilities. It is important to observe that the government in the family follows the patriarchal pattern, differing in some respects from the priesthood leadership in the church. The patriarchal pattern entails that wives and husbands are accountable directly to God for the fulfillment of their sacred responsibilities in the family. It calls for a full partnership, a willing compliance with every principle of righteousness and accountability, and provides opportunities for development within an environment of love and mutual helpness, helpfulness. Did he just yep. name patriarchy as a virtue? In the government? He snuck that one in. <laughs> so patriarchy in the government's a good thing. So no women leaders. Is that what we're getting from that? He redefined patriarchy in the home versus patriarchy in the church. He said patriarchy in the home is different. And yeah, because it's just about being accountable to, to God. Right? Is that what he's saying? I got lost. Yeah. And... Spe specifically, yeah, that, that was really interesting, you know, redefining the word patriarchy and saying that women are part of patriarchy um, in the same role as men. 
which that was not my understanding, but that's good progress. Yeah. Um, and then the next one is that he says that nurturing and providing at the beginning, he said nurturing and providing are both interchangeable responsibilities and both men and, and women are responsible for both equally. Where if you go to the next one in the family proclamation, it says uh, in this sacred, uh, sorry, uh, where it is, by divine design, fathers are to preside over the families in love and righteousness and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection of the family. And mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children. So it basically, the family proclamation distinguishes the responsibilities of the father as being the ones that provide, and the mother is the one that nurture. He just said that they're interchangeable, and you know they can, they they're just equally the same. Um, kind of interesting and and pretty cool progress. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Is he just doing the like separate but equal thing? You know. Yeah. Of like they well, have. Yeah. Or, well, or that's kind of that's kind of what the family proclamation does. I think he he went further, further yeah. and said it's it's all the same. Mm. So how, <laughs> how are you feeling? You you are a woman. It just I don't know. It just feels like nothing to me. Like I was just like <laughs> a standard dude giving a talk. Like I we gleaned nothing from it. People are going to take from it whatever they want. Like it's all just so vague. You can really come away thinking whatever you want. Was the subtext basically? But he with, sure with, made a point to say that you know patriarchy is a good system that we should <laughs> keep in the government as well. So, and was he basically was the subtext? Women, you know, you don't have it that bad. Women, you're more equal than you think. I mean, is that basically what he's saying, Samantha? I mean, I don't know. I truly don't know. I was like tuning out in that one. I'm gonna be real. <laughs> I'm just I mean, like I doubt this man has anything valuable to add about patriarchy. <laughs> You don't see him as a credible source to, to address feminist concerns. Is that what you're saying? I mean, maybe he's like met with a few people who are like getting divorced because men don't take on any domestic labor or something. I don't know. I don't know what's like uh, <laughs> propelling him to make those statements. I can't tell, which I actually can't really tell what he's saying. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks. But for I'm not going to chalk it up as a win. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're not, you're not, people, you're I'm not, not that not desperate for the breadcrumbs. <laughs> you're not getting rebaptized anytime soon. No. Okay. All right. All right. Some people saw its progress. I think it's interesting that he slightly contradicts the family proclamation that it's yeah. signed by, by 15 prophets, seers, and rabbis. But it's not canonized. Yeah. They could have canonized That's it. True. They didn't canonize That's it. That's true. Yeah. And we have him here slightly changing it. Yeah. We'll see what's. That'll be interesting. So when, when people say, like, oh, the family proclamation ha won't change, well, yeah. point them to this talk. All right. Well, the next the next clip is this was a, there was a big big feedback about this. Elder Holland showing empathy for oh, LGBTQ no. <laughs> for LGBTQ individuals. Mm -hmm. um, let's roll roll the tape. I know people in and out of the church who are following Christ just that faithfully. I know children with severe physical disabilities, and I know the parents who care for them. I see all of them working sometimes to the point of total exhaustion, seeking strength and safety and a few moments of joy that can come no other way. I know many single adults who yearn for and deserve a loving companion a wonderful marriage and a home full of children, all their own. No desire could be more righteous. But year after year, such good fortune does not yet come. I know those who are fighting mental illness of many kinds, who plead for help as they pray and pine and claw for the promised land of emotional, emotional stability. I know those who live with debilitating poverty, but defying despair, ask only for the chance to make better lives for their loved ones and others, those in need around them. I know many who wrestle with wrenching matters 
of identity, <clears throat> gender, and sexuality. I weep for them, and I weep with them, knowing how significant the consequences of their decisions will be. Holy moly. I'm going to let you talk first, Gerardo. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, man. When are we going to get out of this, of this idea or, you know, this rhetoric of putting LGBT people together with people with disabilities and mental illness and extreme poverty and, you know, like if there's something wrong with us, you know, I mean, I guess a lot of LGBT people have mental illness, but, um, but why, why something that's so integral of so many people's identity, why, why putting it as a burden, as a burden, you know? And I think the only reason it would be a burden is if there's people out there who are homophobic, who are teaching this type of messages. That's, that's the main reason why it is a burden, not because of the, uh, orient sexual orientation or gender identity themselves. And I think what made me uh, worried the most was because that's the only group where he said that he weeps because he knows how uh, big the consequences of their decisions are going to be. Basically, like a threat, like he's threatening LGBT people, saying like, if you may, you you're the group of people that if you make the ba a bad choice, like the eternal consequences are just, you just have no idea. Um, and yeah, that's hard. <sighs> yeah, thank you, Gerardo. Samantha, you want to add anything? Just the fact that this man is considered a thought leader in any way is wild. Yeah. Well, for me, Gerardo, <clears throat> I mean, you're the authority here, but for me, yeah, he, I mean, what's bad? Having a disability. It's kind of ableist, but, you know, fine. He puts people who leave the church in there, right? Being single. Now, now if you choose to be single because you just want to be single by choice, mm -hmm. you're lumped in with a bunch of baddies, right? People with disabilities, people have mental illness, you know, so there's no, there's no affirmation for people who are single by choice. The childless, now you're pitiful because you're lumped in with all the other pitiful people. There's a, there are people that just for their mental illness can't or don't want to have kids, but like, it's all bad, right? He and just literally is listing groups that he has been part of oppressing. It's like Jeff Bezos being like, I weep for the Amazon factory worker who wasn't able to take a bathroom break. And it's like, you were, you were at the helm. You could have, you could have made that not happen. Yeah. There, there was a really important meme or quote by Maddie East Easton, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where he's basically saying, I'll just paraphrase that elder Holland, what are you doing saying you empathize with the suffering of LGBTQ people? when you represent the institution that caused mm -hmm. their oppression and their suffering. And then when you add to the fact that he's the one that gave the musket talk where he tells BYU faculty administrators <clears throat> to, to pick up their muskets, to, to stand against modern yeah. ideology, same sex marriage and LGBT people. Yeah. Like, like it's, uh, I, I, there's, I don't want to say shameless, but it feels, it does feel shameless. It feels shameless. There's no shame there. Yeah. It's just him trying to legitimize the church's ongoing homophobia. It's like you weep with them, great. Now stop doing the homophobia bit, you know? Like it doesn't, it, it, putting the focus on you, like you weep for them and like listing all the people you're capable of feeling empathy for, well done. But it's like, let's let's be effective about, you know, doing something about it. Yeah, That's not even a thought. This all just serves to placate members who are maybe a bit concerned about the church's homophobia, they can be like, well, Elder Holland feels really sad about having to keep being homophobic. So, I mean, if we're trying to understand his motives, just like with Elder Nelson, President Nelson's, Nelson's abuse talk, Elder, Elder Holland's in the, in the doghouse for his musket <clears throat> talk. So there is kind of a PR optics potential motivation <clears throat> here. It's not just, mm -hmm. hey, he loves LGBTQ people and empathizes with them. Mm -hmm. First of all, he helped cause their oppression. Second of all, he lumped them in with the poor and the mentally ill and the disabled. Um, but third of all, he's trying to restore his tarnished reputation mm -hmm. as being anti-LGBTQ. 
how much can we say this was really altruistically sincerely motivated versus like you got to go throw some throw some love to the lgbtq community because you you really made a mess you really stepped in it now you gotta you gotta reclaim your brand a little bit i hate to be no yeah we, cynical I mean, it's not cynical we've watched that as mainstream attitudes towards lgbtq people have softened so has church rhetoric and i just feel like there comes a point where like yeah we want to analyze people's intentions and we want to kind of pass out potentially like the the good but it's there just comes a certain point where it's like where people in this with this much power are saying things that cause this much harm it, it kind of is irrelevant what their intentions are you know what i mean it's like how how much grace are we trying to give them like i don't think we even need to know necessarily what russell m nelson thinks about abuse what jeffrey r holland thinks like i i believe that he probably does weep for those people that really doesn't change anything either way though because it's the fact of the matter is you have a lot of power you have a lot of influence and you use it for bad whether or not your intentions are good is irrelevant like once you have that level of power it's not really our job to like pass through like potentially the best interpretation of what you're saying it's our job to be like this is what's happening because of the things that you're doing yeah is, <clears throat> and i think what's worse to me is when he said he he doesn't say he weeps because you know your your struggles as lgbt people and members of the church he says he weeps because of how important the consequences of your decisions are going to be which is kind of like me saying oh i weep for my my sister who's serving a mission because of how dumb she's being you know that's uh, by not knowing church history i weep for that it's condescending that, and yeah. insulting a little bit. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's certainly <laughs> falling short of like, we celebrate you. You're perfect just the way you are. <laughs> yeah. Who you love. All love is legitimate <clears throat> and go have great love. Like that's what you want, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And we're so sorry for decades of oppression, you know, and harm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we've gotten just, we've gotten kind of, uh, I mean, this is hard stuff. So, all right, we well, two more slides, two more slides. So there, we're, we don't have a video on this, but uh, for those who weren't paying attention, it's the first time that, that President Nelson delivered uh, his talk sitting down. What is he, 98, 99? Like how old is he? 98, I think. So, I mean, on the one hand, it's a miracle he's still alive and speaking. He is the oldest living prophet in the history of Mormonism, right? Mm -hmm. He passed Hinckley. Yep. So, I mean, that's remarkable. The Lord is keeping his anointed alive for longer than he ever has before. Um, it's a miracle that he's even alive, let alone cogent and coherent. Yeah. Um, but but he is sitting down. Anything we want to say about that, Samantha? Good for him. He deserves to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> he made a post on his social media just talking about why he sat down and saying that, you know, making jokes about being old and how he helped him. But yeah okay there's just something interesting that you made the news and the truth things which i thought was <laughs> old man sits in chair <laughs> <laughs> most yeah. groundbreaking thing that happened yeah yeah i mean i will say that you know with my stepdad once you lose mobility that's you start to go downhill fast mm. so i mean this could be a sign of significant decline in health because once you're not able to walk he's 98 you said i i, I think 98, yeah I mean, yeah yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he wants to make a hundred and he probably will. He probably will. We'll see. All right. Well, that's uh we have one more to go. Um and uh and where's my clicker? One more to go. He just turned oh yeah, he just turned uh 98, 98. on September. Okay. Yeah. All right. The last one is President Nelson talking about why people leave the church. Anything you want to say ahead of this, Herodo? No, I think it's a good closing. Um Okay. Tell us, Elder Click. President Nelson, tell us why we left the church. Here we go. Dear brothers and sisters, I grieve for those who leave the church because they feel membership requires too much of them. They have not yet discovered that making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts, in temples, and keeps them, 
as increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. <laughs> the reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power. Power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. All right, Samantha, I heard, I heard some audible laughter. No, I just thought <laughs> it was funny. I was like, this <laughs> stunning truth <laughs> coming from him. It just made me laugh. Okay. Um, but yeah, he immediately asserted that people leave the church because the church is too much for them, which we know is like a favored narrative among believers because it's self-soothing because then you don't have to address any of the actual, you know, he's not getting up there and being like, I grieve for people who leave the church because they decided that they couldn't be on board with a church founded by a hebophile. You know, he's not going to do that. Um, I also think it's interesting that you said covenants make life easier because a common narrative we hear from believers is that people leave the church because the church is too hard. I mean, that's kind of like what he said right before, right? It's like, they, they again, the double speak, they want to have their cake and eat it too. Sometimes people leave the church because it's it's too hard for them and it's the easy way out to leave. But then also living, staying in the church and living according <laughs> to the church makes life easier. It's like, which one is it, Russell? Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, Gerardo, is life easier for you now? And I don't think easy is really the target. How about just healthier and happier? <laughs> is life easier yeah. and healthier for you now or when you were trying to fit in the church's box? Oh, for sure. No, it's well, easier. Is it easier and healthier both? And healthier. How yeah. can it be easier and healthier? <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't have a, a system of oppression that is telling me how to act, what to do, and to go against, you know, who I am. So I guess it, that just makes it easier. Um, and it's interesting that he does, he also wants to say that, oh, well, people leave the church because it's too hard, but then also they haven't realized that it's actually easier. <laughs> but how about a lot of people who have left who obviously are not coming back and probably won't come back because they know it's easier being outside. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, from a mental health standpoint, I know people who suffer with scrupulosity, religious OCD for decades. Mm -hmm. And when they left the church, guess what? The scrupulosity went away. I know people that suffered from morbid obesity. And when they left the church, all of a sudden they lost 10 or 20, 30, 40 pounds. That's not everyone. That's not to say that losing weight is necessarily good, but there are people whose health, mental health, physical health dramatically improves uh, also their happiness. Honestly, people wouldn't leave. If, if people were healthier and happier in, why would they ever leave? Like, so it is, it is wrong. It is harmful. It's insulting. This idea of having heavenly power when you were in, I was never able to access heavenly power. Not once. And I tried. I tried to call down miracles. I was never able to do it. So to say that I lost heavenly power, I was faithful for a long, long, long time. That heavenly power, that's one of the reasons I started having a faith crisis. I'm like, where is heavenly power? I bless someone, they're still sick or they die. Like, okay, I pray that X, Y, and Z will happen. Well, it didn't. Like, I don't, you know, um, so it's insulting. It's harmful. <clears throat> it's invalidating. It's just flat out inaccurate. And it's, it's super hurtful. And it's, it's reinforcing these stereotypes that, mm -hmm. that we were weak, that we just got offended, that we wanted to sin, that we couldn't, we weren't as valiant. And what's harder, what's harder? Tell me, Russell and Nelson, what's harder than leaving a high demand religion yeah, than having your spouse want to leave you, having your parents feel disappointed in you, losing your entire community, losing your identity, losing your sense of morality, your source of spirituality, losing your community. What's harder? What's, you know, what's more difficult? You tell me. Um, Literally being up against millions of years of evolution, wiring you to protect your deeply held beliefs at all costs and te telling your brain that if you, if your worldview collapses, you will die. You have to stay with your tribe. You have to maintain your worldview or your very survival is at stake which sometimes it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's super disappointing. And but now people are just gonna say we were just looking to criticize, looking to <laughs> find the negative, and that all right, let me make an argument. Like one of my criticisms of General Conference, and we're coming back to how we started, is that it was sort of like I talked to people who worked in ER rooms, emergency rooms and hospitals in Utah. Mm -hmm. And I had had it, I've had it confirmed to me multiple times that self admissions or admissions to the ER spiked right, right after general conference mm. because of statements by Oak statements by Boyd K Packer that, that led people literally to be suicidal. Wow. Like if that's the index, We've been curmudgeons. We found all the problems with, or many of the problems with this, this uh, general conference. If we're just measuring it by the index of ER admissions, can't we say that maybe this is the best general conference in our lifetime? In that have by that by lower? that metric, have they been lower this conference? Is that what you're saying? I just I don't know, but I would it just assume a lot more benign. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there was more there, progress. I, this seems to be the least outrageous, the least harmful general conference of my lifetime. No, uh, who's to say? <laughs> well, I'm just saying, can we, can we try to say something? I mean, can, <laughs> can we try to pick something? I would good? agree. I, I agree that there, 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 I was surprised by the progress. I was surprised by, you know, the change in language. Um, you know, we mentioned the family proclamation thing. I, I respect Sam's opinion. Um, I, I am not to say if women should feel better or not. I think it, the language is different from the family proclamation. It's progress, you know, the, um, and the, uh, you know, the update to the youth pamphlet and that stuff. I mean, it's, it's good. Like we've talked about things are probably not going to change in the near future. People are probably going to keep thinking the same way and they know it. But it's good that they're um, making changes. Yeah. I do think the youth pamphlet was a little bright spark because that was a thing where that actually has the potential to lessen people's psychological dependency on the church. But my issue with the whole thing just being more benign is like, okay, well, if an organization that is encouraging psychological dependency on it, that is corrupt and harmful and enormously wealthy and powerful gets better at PR and, uh, you know, masking its true nature from people is that good i can't say like i it's it's hard to know isn't it yeah yeah and then there's just always there's always the challenge of like d does it amount to rearranging chairs on the deck of the titanic that's sinking where's the substantive yeah. change all we get is another 18 temples mm -hmm. and you know these are temples that the church you know <clears throat> is probably not going to have many members to attend let alone temple workers to staff. Yeah. It's almost just like a bit, another flex, another legacy play, another 20 temples are being announced, but where's the substantive meaningful change? I, I don't think we got it, but, but we got a better pamphlet and that's good. So congratulations, president elder Uchtdorf. Congratulations church. We're glad because let's face it. Some of the biggest harm done in the church is with the youth. Yeah. So congratulations, sincere, heartfelt congratulations, Elder Dorf and Church for improving the pamphlet for the youth. Yeah. 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 Samantha gives a reluctant shrug. No, you can use congratulations as the word of choice if you want. I just think it's important to, like, we can talk for 10,000 hours, and you have on this wonderful podcast, <laughs> about how the church's truth claims are false and its teachings are harmful. But the thing that just, I think we just all need to keep perspective that like everything that was on display, this general conference, the double speak, the gaslighting, the PR moves, all of it is like textbook high demand religions and cults, textbook high control group trying to retain control of people so that they remain psychologically dependent on the organization. And in my opinion, it is not healthy to be psychologically dependent on an organization like Mormonism. And Mormons are also not unique in their strategies. Like everything we saw at this general conference, you would see at a Jehovah's Witness conference, at a Scientology conference, like it's all the same stuff. They're all using the same psychological tactics to keep people psychologically dependent. The content, you know, we can talk about all day, but at the end of the day, it's just about those tactics. 
Um, Andrew Fike says, backstory on Samantha, please. Andrew Fike, Google uh, Losing Mormon Millennials on Mormon Stories podcast or Samantha Shelley. We've interviewed Samantha. Just recently, we did one, a Thrive story about you, Samantha. Yes, we did. You didn't like it? <laughs> no, it, it just was very personal. Yeah, but it's amazing. So but you, you and Margie did a great job. If you want to learn more about Samantha, check out the episodes on Mormon Stories uh, about Samantha. Um, all right, Gerardo, we want to give you a final word. Any final word? Um, I feel like I already did, but okay. um, I'll just say, well, I hope, um, you know, that the church keeps changing. I mean, we know it's not going to go away. So <laughs> at least, uh, at least, you know, that I think that's what we do, what we do. Uh, we speak out so that this changes uh, can continue to happen and I'm glad they're happening and a faster pace than I ever thought they would. You know, I, I mean, seeing people on social media wearing straps and calling themselves LDS never thought that would be, they would get the church's stamp, amp, a stamp of approval and they just <clears throat> basically did. So yeah, yeah. That, that would be my thoughts. I'll just say I'm glad things are slowly getting better. I think they are slowly getting better. My prayer, my secular prayer, is that what we don't see is kind of two steps forward, one step back. Because so just like the good cop, bad cop dynamic that we talked about, mm -hmm. that's what abusers do. They abuse you and then they show you extra love and then they abuse you again and then they show extra love. If we can kind of like, if we can bank all this progress and never have another Oaks talk condemning same-sex marriage, uh, you know, another another talk, putting women in their place or whatever it is, if we can kind of mark this as a benchmark and then never slide back on any of the important issues, then it will be a positive step. But if we just look at subsequent conferences taking us back in those bad directions, then we're right back to kind of the good cop, bad cop, abusive spouse. I love you. I hate you. Come here. Let me hug you. Now let me beat you. And And that's harmful. So that's my prayer, my secular prayer. All right. Well, Samantha, it's always lovely to have you. Thank you for joining us. And tell us again how people find your social media stuff and your coaching practice. Um, well, my ex-Mormon YouTube channel slash TikTok everywhere is Zelf on the Shelf. My personal socials are all at the Samspo. And then my Faith Transition coaching website is samanthashellycoaching.com. And that's T-H-E-S-A-M-P-S-O, right? The Samspo? Yeah. All right. <laughs> the Sam spoke. All right. And Gerardo, it's so great and such an honor to have you as a colleague here on Mormon Stories. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for preparing this episode. It absolutely wouldn't have happened without you. Not with, <laughs> with my week, with my month, this would have never happened. It almost didn't, but thank you for making it happen. Yeah. Gerardo, people love uh lo both of you, people love having you guys on. So please come back as often as you can. All right, Gerardo. For sure. All right, Samantha. Yeah. We come back. <laughs> You're coming back soon, right? We're, yeah. Do do we announce? I mean, we've got our do it. We've got our Dan Dan Ban Bam mm -hmm. episode. Daniel Spencer. Daniel Spencer coming out soon. Iconic. And what's the interview we've got coming down the pike? Do you want to announce we it? We are interviewing the Tomsters, who is another hilarious social media creator. That's like next week, right? Yeah, I'm so excited. It, it, awesome. we'll interview I love him. his content. We'll interview him next, him and his wife. And next wife, week. yeah. Yeah, but but um, there's my dad. Hey, dad, welcome back to the, my dad's walking behind you, Samantha. Um, we'll do the interview next week when we release it. It'll be probably three or four weeks out. But anyway, and dad, I see you in the background. Dad, it was really great to have you on Mormon Stories. Thanks for thanks for joining us, dad. It's been a pleasure being here. All right, we love you, dude. All right. Well, thanks for joining us on Mormon Stories. Thanks to Nemo as well. Be kind to each other. Uh, please give us super chats. Thanks to JC for uh, the super chat right now. You can always donate um, through through YouTube by clicking on the dollar sign and, and throwing us a donation. That helps pay for Gerardo's time, Samantha's time, Nemo's time, and mine. Um, you can also uh, thanks Keith for your donation. Uh, you can always um, go to MormonStories.org, click on the donate button become a monthly donor. We lose donations every month for a variety of reasons. Thanks, uh, Carrie Hansen Doty for your donation. Um, uh, we lose donations every month, so we need donors to replace donors who cancel. So please become a monthly donor if you can. Um, and then also the Facebook uh, platform, you can click on the stars feature and you can donate that way. 
we're getting we're getting more and more revenue from Facebook. And so we're trying to invest in Facebook. TikTok gives you squat. TikTok just doesn't give you anything other than like eyeballs. But Facebook pays you not as well as YouTube right now, but it's 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 nice. So anyway, we're grateful for Facebook throwing us some bones here and there. Thanks to you, Gerardo and and Julia for the shorts. You guys are helping out a lot with that. Also, thanks to Maven. Maven moderated the chat, and we're really grateful for all the work Maven is doing behind the scenes. But but be kind to each other, love each other. Uh, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com with feedback. Follow us. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. We're getting like two, 2,000 to 2,500 new subscribers a month on YouTube. If we follow in that uh, trajectory, we'll have 100,000 um, YouTube subscribers, which is a decent benchmark, especially for a Mormon a plaque. Do you get Do you get a silver plaque for that? I'm not sure if they stopped doing it, but I think well, you do. I'll look it up. I want my gosh darn silver plaque. Yeah, so. you deserve it. So, so everybody, and Samantha, you were you helped us get onto YouTube. I don't know if you remember. Did and I? You attended a, a retreat years ago Cute. up at Park City. You're like, John, why aren't you on YouTube? I had no idea that was Yeah, that was you. That was you. So anyway, we have you to thank for that. But you, you, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Please follow us on, on Facebook, on TikTok, on Instagram. Subscribe and uh, comment, and that helps with the algorithms. But most importantly, be kind to each other, love each other, and uh, and thanks for the support. And we'll uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.